Hello, welcome to this course. My name is Casey Shah. It is my immense honor to have you in my course, and I really mean it. While I'm super excited, I am also a bit nervous. What am I nervous about? I'm nervous about delivering on the outcomes that you might be expecting. To that end, I have spent hundreds of hours in creating this course. I have put my two decades of experience and expertise in creating this course. Now it's time for us to work together. Cloud computing is one of the hottest technologies today. Cloud computing revenues has grown from mere $1 billion in 2012 to over $200 billion in 2018. The revenues are expected to cross $1 trillion by 2022. Yet, most of the experts say that cloud is in its infancy. What does it mean for you and me? It means that learning about the cloud, mastering the cloud, and getting certified with the cloud technologies is going to be our ticket. The reason you get certified, cloud technologies or not, is to prove your expertise. It's like your SAT, GRE, GMAT test, right? Your knowledge has been tested by independent third party who certifies that you have this kind of knowledge. Similarly, in IT certifications, your knowledge is verified by the vendor, such as cloud computing vendors, for example, Google, AWS, Microsoft, and they verify that you are competent with these technologies. So it really gives employers confidence that you are competent and you'll be able to do a great job in their environment. So that's general logic for getting certified. Now I'll turn to more specific reason why you should get cloud certified. Cloud computing is relatively new, relatively new. It's only 10 years ago, AWS started it, and more so in last four years, 2014 to 2018, is when cloud computing came to the forefront of things. Cloud certification is even newer. So there are relatively small number of cloud certified professionals, relatively small. There are a total of 45 million IT folks, including developers, system admins, network engineers, so on and so forth. There are 45 million of those in the world. There are less than 10,000 cloud certified professionals today, much less than that, actually. So you are a unique person. You are just, just put simple math of supply and demand, right? I mean, you are in high demand because cloud computing revenues are growing rapidly. They are doubling and tripling the revenues each vendor is. So demand is rising, but there aren't enough certified professionals out there. It means that you're going to be in high demand for now and for foreseeable future. You're gonna enhance your career path, you're gonna grow faster, you're gonna enter a new career if that's what you desire, and you're gonna recession-proof your job for foreseeable future. And, and you know, if you get multi-cloud certification, especially, think about it, if you get several AWS certifications, several G GCP, Google Cloud certifications, several uh, Azure certifications like MCS, MCSE, let's say you have six of those combined, you'll be one in maybe 30 people in the world to have that combination. So you are going to really enhance. You're going to put your career on fast track. You're going to write your own salary check. You're going to define your own compensation package. So time is now to get cloud certified. So let's get going. Once again, thank you very much for signing up for this course. It is my tremendous honor to have you on board in this course. KC Shah, thank you. Hello, KC Shah here from Hello Cloud Sets. In this video, I'll walk you through what is Getting Started Guide and how you should use it. As the name suggests, Getting Started Guide means you should start here, read me, start here, whatever you want to call it. But this is your most important document, in my opinion, in this course. 
The reason I say that it's most important, even though it's not substantive, it's not technical, it is really start of your course. You want to make sure you have all the information at your fingertips. You want to make sure that you're taking advantage of the information I have given to you, you have access to from the beginning, right? Oftentimes you get deep into the course and then you don't realize that you had this free one-on-one -on -one guidance with Casey and you never knew about it, you never used it, and somebody else tells you, right? Or you don't pass the exam, for example, right? For God forbid. But if you have that information in the beginning, I think it's it will be very powerful. So what does this guide have? It's a short four or five page PDF document. It's attached to this lecture as a resource. You should download it. Uh, you can click on the top left uh, on the resources for this lecture and download it to your laptop. The information is uh, very important in this document, as I already mentioned. For example, I'll walk you through how to outline. Oftentimes, it would have some information that will point to you more information. I have some other information shared over the Google Drive document shared in uh, uh, other lectures in this course so it's a part of the resources it could be part of other uh, lectures uh, in this course as well so make sure that you have access to it you have read through what is where and organize yourself it is uh, my goal to put everything in this document and then sort of pointer to pointer if there is another document for it at least i'll mention it here that where it is so it is more organized for you and for me as well very important document once again i cannot emphasize it has a lot of good information for example how do you get hold of me right uh, communication channel document the core structure for this you know what does it mean you know what is thermometer cases thermometer i have uh, questions uh, in these courses for you practice questions and i have question difficulty what does it mean to you or how did i design it right so when you pass or don't answer a question correctly for example which is degree of difficulty 70 what does it mean to you so i have that in this document again there are points interest to a point to point to you some other documents in many cases so make sure you go through this very important document for you i cannot emphasize more i think i have but i cannot emphasize more you must download this you should make this available on your on your mobile phone you know put it on a google drive put it as a uh, notes in your iphone or android phone whatever you're using put it on your uh, tablet however you consuming your information make sure that it's available to you uh, if i were you i would print it out uh, and then mark it along the way and i have it in the instructions in the pdf document and um, that's how i like to do i like uh, my information in both formats pdf as well as in uh, printed format uh, I go back and forth it's really fun to work on the document and make your notes and then try you know it, it, it helps you um, some research suggests that if you write something with your own hand with a pen uh, you you're likely to retain it twice uh, you're twice more likely to retain it than just electronic uh, but of course you need to have electronic information as well because you're gonna find information from many sources you have to you have to do both in my opinion right so Make sure that uh, you take advantage of this document and all the resources I have in this document. So let's succeed together. I leave the light on for you. Thank you very much. Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. Bye bye. Hello, Casey Shah here. In this video, I'll talk about expected outcomes or the outcomes that I'm targeting for this course. Now, you're already here, so that means that you have probably read through the outcomes that I'm targeting for this course. In any event, I want to go through it one more time. So I have attached a PDF document that has the outcomes that I'm targeting for this particular course. At this point, I would encourage you to download the document and open it up and make sure that you are 100% aligned to what I am targeting and what your expectations are. If for some reason you are already here and you didn't realize the outcomes that I'm targeting, not a problem. Udemy offers this unique 30-day money-back, no question asked guarantee. You can exercise that money-back guarantee if you feel that the outcomes you're expected are not aligned with the outcomes that I'm targeting. 
maybe another course from me or other instructor is more suited for your expectation and that's totally fine that's why udemy money back guarantee is there for if we have shared goals it is easier to achieve that so let's work together and let's succeed together i'll leave the light on for you i'll work very hard for you in this course i guarantee you and i need your help along the way so let's work together let's make it happen let's get you certified i'm pumped up i hope you are energized as well thank you very much casey shah from hello cloud certs bye bye hello casey shah from hello cloud certs in this video i'll walk you through practice exam based training format that i have come up with as you may have heard me in my introduction lecture that i have taken over 100 certification exams through the success and failures yes failures as well i have learned a lot one of those learnings has translated into innovation of this practice exam based training format before i go into the details of the formula let me explain you the problem that i'm trying to solve traditional courses including many of my courses are what i call sequential courses for example, in case of cloud computing, I start with why you need cloud computing, uh, what are regions, what, are, what is zone, what is a compute engine, what is a storage, what is database, and then what are platforms, machine learning, data analytics, so on and so forth, on and on. And these course become 10, 20, 30, 40 hour courses. Udemy and others have done some research and found that only one in 10 learners reach the end of the course. Even though all 10 of them have given great reviews, so they like the course, but they just do not go to the end of it. The one who goes to the end generally succeeds, especially in certification exam focused courses. So to increase the engagement, Udemy and others recommend micro learning, so short courses, short lessons and really focused on outcomes i've been thinking about this problem for a while and a year ago uh, i i tried a different approach i came up with this format called practice exam based training the way it works is i teach you i give you 30 questions highly curated focused similar degree of difficulty uh, as actual exam 30 questions I have broken it down in three set of 10 questions. Question one through 10, 11 through 20, and 21 through 30. So the way I start is I give you an outlining format, you know, just a blank template that you need to fill out along the way. Before I give you any question, I give you a really fun one hour Google exercise, Google search exercise. So I tell you that, you know, search these items and then fill in information in your outline. Not exactly matching the question I'm going to ask, but somewhere around there. So it'll be one hour exercise. You do Google search, you learn the information, and then you have 10 questions in a quiz format that you will answer. Then I'll explain each question in a video format. I'll give you PDF as well. And then we go into the details, substantive detail of the topic touched by that question. I follow those, some of those questions with hands-on labs. I, I show you or I, you know, I demonstrate to you how to build compute engine, for example, virtual machines, auto scaling, uh, or whatever that topic requires, virtual private cloud, networking, load balancing, security aspects, you name it. So I connect the dots that way. Then I move on to the next 10 questions, next 10 questions. So you have the 30 questions, 30 video answers, 30 PDF answers, substantive material concept covered in those questions in various topics of those covered in, the, in that particular practice exam based training. And then you learn. At the end, I synthesize the whole course technically. So I say, you know, these are the things, very high level key points that you learned. Revise it one more time. You know, again, go in some depth of those topics and then we finish this it's about three or four hour course so you know instead of going sequentially i sort of have changed this to practice exam based and i have i've tested it on uh, one of my courses i have seen great results in my other course nine out of ten of my learners reach the end of the course they complete the course i have gotten 4.97 out of five reviews 
from dozens of reviewers over the last year. So I have expanded upon this format, and this course is based on this practice exam based innovative and disruptive format. I have more details in the attached PDF document. Make sure to download and go through that to learn more about this format, how exactly it works. Thank you very much. Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Certs. Bye bye. Welcome to Hello Cloud Certs. Say hello to your future. My name is Casey Shah. This video is about AWS EC2 exam focus notes. This is the summary section for EC2. EC2 stands for Elastic Compute. It's one of the first, perhaps second, I think, after S3 services that AWS offered for their cloud computing. So AWS EC2 provides computing services, their flagship product these days, uh, one of their highest revenue generator. EC2 dashboard provides several capabilities related to deploying EC2. So it's not just a deployment of a server. I will briefly walk you through the EC2 dashboard. It does have various other services, and I cover those in in individual lectures, individual videos. For for example, load balancer is part of EC2 dashboard, and I have a totally separate lecture on that, a video on that. And uh, there, you know, there are several other sub-services like auto-scaling, for example, for EC2. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see like a bunch of other services. So I'll walk you through that and we'll go through that. AMI. AMI, you're going to hear a lot about, if not already, is called Amazon, stands for Amazon Machine Image. It is a template. It's not really an OS itself. It's a template that contains software configuration for an EC2 instance. So AWS and all the cloud providers have done a pretty good job of separating out the the, the configuration piece from the operating system. So template tells you what the user requested, such as host name, the storage amount, the type, and all that information is in a template. And EC2 instance is rolled based on that configuration combined with the operating system image and launching it as an instance. EC2 instance keeps running until you stop it or terminate it. So it's going to be running in the background or foreground. And it, you're going to get charged until you stop it or terminate it. EC2 is built on a per second basis. This is relatively new. AWS was building on a per hour basis for a long period of time. Google Cloud started building on a per second basis and AWS followed suit and uh, they started building on a per second basis as well. For only for Linux instances, for Windows, perhaps for licensing reasons, uh, they still charge based on a per hour basis. When you stop an EC2 instance, important for all your exam preparations, EC2 instance, you do not get billed for the compute. However, you do get billed for the storage, persistent storage, if you are booting off of an EC EBS volume, for example, they'll continue to be billed when you stop an instance. But if you terminate an instance, billing for EC2 compute instance is gone, and by default, your EBS volume will be deleted, and that billing will be gone too. You can change that behavior, and I talk about that in EBS lecture. EC2 instance can be backed by, or it's called boot, booted off by, right, in uh, standard... Uh, system admin terminology when they, when it says backed by meaning it's booted off of an instant store meaning a local storage volume it's called instant store or an elastic block storage volume somewhere out and just mapped to this instance so it has both options you have both options some instances are do not support instant store only bs option is available so it really depends on which instance you're launching from the menu that uh, AWS console or this command line provides or whatever AWS services provide, right? So you have to 
they map it for you that this particular type of image is only EBS backed and you cannot have instant store and others are instant stores. You can have you can still map EBS volumes to it, but you cannot boot off in those cases. Instant store is a temporary storage. So it is a temporary storage, not a permanent storage. What does it mean? And it's deleted. It is deleted when an instance is terminated. So when you terminate an instance, it's gone. Okay? And it cannot be stopped because it's temporary storage. When you stop an instance, AWS, and when you stop an instance, AWS will remove that instance. That server is gone. That capacity is available to someone else. When you start an instance, it really starts fresh. It can go on another host within AWS environment as well, but it's just going to mount the EBS volume that you booted off of that was backed by. But in instance, though, that's not possible. It's a local storage, and if you stop it, it it's gone. So you cannot even stop it. You, the stop button option would be grayed out for instance store, instance backed, uh, uh, sorry, instance store backed instance. EBS backed instance volumes are not deleted upon termination by default, as I mentioned. To change that behavior, you change delete on termination attribute. When you deploy it through the console, you will see that. When you deploy it through command line, you have to provide that. Or you, when you deploy it through the cloud formation, you provide that attribute. So it can, it's configurable, but default is delete on termination. So when you delete an EC2 instance that was booted off of EBS volume, that EBS volume will also be terminated when you terminate the EC2 instance. But that can be changed if you want to keep that and boot another instance or that instance later on from that. But you want to terminate for some reason, not stop it. There's no reason to do that. But if you do, then that, that volume can still stay on in your EBS volume space. IAM stands for Identity and Access Management. I have a video on that. Very detailed, hands-on, a number of things on IAM, very important topic, is used to control access to and from EC2 instances. You can, you can say that this EC2 instance can access S3. And what level of access? Then you don't have to log in. To that. Once that you go into that EC2 instance uh, as a username there on that EC2 ins instance, default is EC2 hyphen user, you can then just type S3, AWS S3 LS, and you will see your S3 buckets, for example, manage those right from EC2. You don't have to do AWS configure command and provide credentials like you would from a CLI because that EC2 instance has that access. So programmatically from that EC2 instance, you can access other resources. That's the use case. EC2 instances are launched in a region in an availability zone. So actually they're launched on a subnet actually. So this is the whole hierarchy. So you would be in a region, in a region you'll be in availability zone. On an availability zone, you will deploy a subnet and on the subnet in a VPC, uh, that instance will reside, right? So if you draw out a bit of hierarchy, this if this is your region, this could be your VPC in a region This could be an availability zone in a region. This could be a subnet in a region. I'll just draw a line. And this could be your EC2 instance in that availability zone. Okay, so that's sort of a hierarchy where EC2 instance resides. It doesn't reside in a region itself. It really resides on a subnet which lives in a availability zone, which lives in a VPC, which lives in a region. EC2 instance contains metadata about itself. When you deploy it, it has metadata that it will store in a file, and that's accessible through this local only URL. Okay, that's accessible only from that instance itself. It's a 169.254, 169.254 latest meta hyphen data. You cannot access it from another instance because it's non-routable IP, 169.254. You can provide post-installation script. 
So if you want to deploy a Linux server and put an agent on it or do certain things, update with the YAM updates or, you know, you can want to do, let's say, put your company's standard software on top of that instance or policy, you run a script under what is called user data field. You provide that and that instance, when it boots up, will run that on top of booting off and being available, it's going to execute that script and do that post install steps. Okay, let's look more here. EC2 instance backed by an EBS volume can be resized. You can resize. So if you have a server, say R1 type of instance and you want to resize it to a higher size you can stop it and it, provided it's backed by EBS you can stop it and then you can say resize and bring it up uh, bump it up to in size so now AWS will deploy it on another host perhaps give you whatever CPU memory you ask for but still use the same EBS volume that was attached or booted off uh, or used to boot off the other instance, right, that you're resizing. So resize instance would have the same operating system, same data, same modifications you did, just bigger machine, higher uh, throughput, maybe better, uh, you know, more core CPU, memory, whatever you picked in that instance, you will have that. So resizing is an option. You don't have to do it do the data transfers because it's all software defined so it can be done and it's done by resizing ec2 instances family are instance family types are general purpose compute optimized memory optimized storage optimized accelerated so based on their customers needs and requirements over years now over a decade aws keep refining the type of instances you can deploy. General purpose are good for any use cases, but then you have compute optimized, you have memory optimized workload, storage optimized, a lot of IOPS, accelerated computing, high performance computing. So they have these categories, and within categories, there are multiple options that you can pick from, different pricing for each one of those options. So pricing still remains on a per hour basis, but they will charge you prorated on a per second for Linux, per hour for Windows workload. EC2 instance can be purchased as in three purchasing options, either on, oh, sorry, more, five. On demand, reserved, spot, dedicated, and scheduled instance. On demand is your most typical. You say whatever is available, give me uh, M2 type of a server, and it's gonna find that for you. And you have it, and there is a particular cost per hour basis, prorated to per second for Linux once again, and per hour for Windows. A reserve capacity, if you have, let's say, 300 servers, out of that 50 servers minimum you always run, you never below 50, then it makes sense to go reserved routes. You reserve that capacity, meaning you pay a front to AWS, either one year, two year, or three year term. More you pay a front, better discount you get. So. It's, it's really like you kind of lose a little bit of on-demand functionality that you went to cloud for, but you save the money because anyways, you want 50 servers. And it doesn't have to be earmarked that these 50, only the type, you know, you'd select that these 50 would be this type of servers, memory optimized or the class of servers. And you can then uh, deploy any, you know, for any use case you have. And those 50 would get that reserved pricing. And then beyond that, it'll be on-demand. Spot is a, a great concept that AWS introduced years ago where they, they have excess capacity. They don't build exactly what their customers need. They had always have a lot of excess capacity on a hour by hour, minute by minute basis, it changes. So instead of letting it uh, stay there, not make any money for them, they have this spot market where you can purchase these instances at a deep discount, up to 90% discount, uh, and you can use those if your workload is designed to use, you know, horizontally scale, you can certainly deploy 
tens, hundreds, I've seen thousands of spot instances coming up and go away. And then you, you use those, accelerate your computing or whatever your application is trying to do, finish the job and release those. Or AWS can come in and terminate those as well, uh, take over those spot instances. That's the only drawback. But the downside is uh, for off the spot is the the it can be terminated because what happens is in the spot you you bid for the spot price you say you know I want to pay one cent per hour and if somebody wants to pay one point one cent an hour then you lose your uh, spot and if they don't have anything else available they can terminate your spot instances they give you two minute warning like a NFL football game. And you have to terminate that, uh, those, I mean, they will terminate those, but you have to, within two minutes, you have to, you know, do this graceful exit of your application, release all the resources, whatever you want to do, you have those two minutes to do. And, you you know, grab more, and it's it's a game, essentially. It's, you're bidding against other users like yourself, and if your bid is highest, you're going to win. If not, others will win, and you may lose it also as demand goes up you may lose the spot servers you already have. So so that's for a specific use case, temporary high demand. You want to process something very quickly, maybe nightly processing, batch processing, you want like as many servers available, but you don't spend too much money. Uh, but if it takes, you know, a um, little bit less time for a little bit more money, you're okay with it. Eh, worst case, you know, you'll spend more time on or your resources systems will spend more time crunching that data. So very specific use case of uh, short term uh, compute usage. So that's spot. Dedicated is uh, for companies who are afraid that their underlying host is shared by other customer as well. And they have some compliance requirements or they want to have it is uh, completely dedicated then they would uh, go for dedicated. So essentially, the underlying host will be earmarked for you, whether you use it or not, you will pay for that. And then scheduled instances is a relatively newer offering. You can schedule an instance in the future. So you can say, I will need this type of instance on this particular day, and you can schedule that. Reserved instances uh, with a three-year upfront is the most attractive discount, you get up to 60% off. So if you have those opportunities that you always need some service, use those. Spot instances offer 90%, up to 90% discount. Um, and it's suitable for temporary and bursty workload. Reserve instances can be resold. So if you bought reserve instances, your business model changed, and instead of 50, now you're only able to use 30, then you can resell the 20 in the open reserve instance marketplace that AWS has created. Um, so you might lose a little, you paid some, and you, you resell for something, just like any other item that you might, you know, in your home or in your life that you bought and you want to resell. Convertible reserved instances is uh, a category of reserved instances or popularly known as RI, where you can convert from one to the other class. So you bought memory optimized, we want to jump to uh, storage optimized, for example, you can convert those. So there's a base, you, you can convert only certain ways and, and not uh, certain other ways. There is some uh, there are some restrictions and um, methodology how you can do that, but it gives you that option that you're not stuck into this category you bought into. You can convert up or you can convert down if you want. You get, then you have to have two. So if you bought a very high-end instance, but that requirement is not there, but it's a reserved instance, you're stuck with it in RI. But if you had bought convertible RI, you can convert that big one, break it down into two smaller Types, right? So if you have 16 CPU, now you can have two 8 CPU instances and convert those into reserved instances. So instead of one big, you have two smaller uh, convertible reserved instances. You still get the reserved instance discount. So that's pretty much it for EC2 uh, aspect. On the other side, uh, let's go through the EC2 console a little bit. So let me log into the AWS console as an admin IAM user. And let's type in EC2 in our search and go into EC2. So as I was talking about, there are 
Bunch of services under EC2 dashboard. You see, this is the EC2 dashboard. You have many, many, many options here. Instance is just one of them. Right here, you can have a launch template. You can define a template and then launch instances from it. You have spot, you have reserve, you have dedicated host. AMI, Amazon Machine Images, you can customize yours and build your instances off of those. You can bundle some tasks. These are the EBS, Elastic Block Storage Volumes, Snapshots. Networking is here for EC2 security groups. It's also accessible from VPC, but you access it here as well. Static IPs, call Elastic IPs are here. Placement groups. Uh, there's a separate lecture for that, but placement groups essentially helps you determine uh, if you want certain servers to be deployed together, then you put, put them in placement groups so they have low latency between them. Otherwise, AWS can pick a different hosts for your underlying EC2 instances. But if you want them to be on the same host, underlying host, you put them in a placement group. And similarly, if you want them to be apart, there are two types of placement groups, right? Spread placement group is another option within a placement group. You definitely want those to be spread. So failure domain is extended for you, right? If one of their hosts fails, not everything fails for you. Key pairs, this is for your uh, SSH type of keys. Uh, you can log into the servers with those keys. And network, Interfaces, you can multiple, you can have additional network interfaces within your uh, environment. Um, and let's see more here. Load balancers is the next one. So you configure those here, separate lectures for load balancers. Auto scaling, if you want to horizontally scale your EC2 resources, you configure those here. And system manager services. Uh, your operation. You can run a command on an EC2 instance without logging in, uh, just providing credentials here. State state manager, configuration, compliance, automations, patch compliance, patch baselines, system manager sh shared resources. So these are resources shared across managed instances, acti activations, documents, maintenance windows, parameter stores, and patches. So this, these two aspects are operational. The rest are also operational, but more for deployment of uh, servers and services um, from the console. But these are more for uh, uh, once they are deployed, you can manage those. Okay, so I'll switch back here. We started off this lecture with the EC2, focus on EC2 exam focus notes summary section. Exam relevance for EC2. Obviously, very, very central to all of your AWS certifications, starting from certified cloud practitioner to AWS certified architect professional and specialization certifications. So all the 10 plus certifications AWS offers, this is one of the most important and highly tested topic. So make sure that you're deploying a lot of a lot of those EC2 instances during your learning, during your professional life. So this is something that will become second nature to you. Initially, you will have to learn what it is, what it is all about. How do you go about uh, understanding different purchasing options of EC2? You know, what are the classes of EC2 instances? We talked about general purpose, memory intensive, uh, storage intensive, so on and so forth. Purchasing options were on-demand, spot, and uh, reserved instances and others. So understand those aspects. Uh, make sure that you do all the labs that I have for EC2 and do additional labs on your own. Master the topic. This lecture once again is EC2 summary. The details are in the same document below. Make sure to go through that as well. And that should conclude it. Once again, my name is Casey Shaw from Hello Cloud Certs. Say hello to your future. Thank you very much. All right, let's look at this question ID HCCAWS PQ1028. This is for AWS practice exam preparation from Hello Cloud Search, say hello to your future. Which of the following AWS service provides simple and scalable file system like storage? File system like storage, so I'll highlight that for use with multiple 
That's very important. Multiple EC2 instances. The correct answer is D. Elastic File System provides that. EFS gives you access to a file system like storage, and that can be mounted by multiple systems. EBS is a block storage. It will you can store your files. You can have a file system on it. But the only problem with EBS is multiple EC2 instances. You can only mount to one EC2 instance at a time. So that is not fulfilled. S3 is not a block storage, not a file system like block storage. Although there are third-party utilities like CloudBerry Explorer and others where which you can use to sort of get file system like look and fill but it's not a block storage it's not to be used on the servers instant store is a block storage again it's not an object simple file system like object storage um, although it can be used so it's a file it's it's a it could be amount uh, your boot volume or it could be an additional instant store you can create a file system but it would have the same problem as EBS. It cannot be mounted by multiple systems at the same time. So once again, EFS is the right answer for this question. EFS is a file system-like interface for storing your objects, and that can be accessed simultaneously by multiple EC2 instances. Other options cannot do so. So that's conclusion of Question HCC AWS PQ1028. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search. This is AWS Hands On Lab. The topic is AWS Console. The lab ID for this lab is HCC AWS Lab 1024. Degree of difficulty is 50, 65 is average, 100 is the highest. Uh, for more information on uh, these two parameters and other taxonomy, please check out hellocloudsearch.com slash taxonomy. The objective of this lab is getting familiar with AWS console. This is for folks who may not have logged into AWS before or are very, very new. If you are somebody who has worked on AWS before, logged in several times, then you can skip this lab. These are the high-level steps that I'll be taking during this demonstration. I'll show you how to create a free tier account on AWS. We'll be exploring EC2. We'll be exploring S3. We'll be exploring VPC. We'll be exploring IAM, which is Identity and Access Management. VPC is Virtual Private Cloud. We'll be exploring Monitoring Tool CloudWatch. We'll be exploring Trusted Advisor. We'll be exploring Billing and a few other services. So that's sort of a highlight on, or a game plan on what we are going to do in this lab. So with that said, let me jump on to the other window where I'm gonna be showing you how to get on AWS. So as I said, first thing you would do is go to the free tier, uh, figure out where how to get on to the free tier. So you'd go to Google and type AWS free tier. And the first non-advertised link would take you that straight away. Create an account at this point right here. It's not harder than creating an email new email address, new email account. So it's pretty straightforward. Just walk yourself through. Should not take you more than a couple of minutes to get that done. Once you complete that, you are going to be logging in. So I have done that already. And this is the AWS login page. If you click on that yellow link, you will come here. You put in your email address and the password and you sign in to AWS at this point. You're locked in with the new username that you just created with the free tier access. Now, one thing I wanted to mention about the free tier, so I will go back there, free tier, or maybe a few things I would like to mention, uh, that there are two types of free tiers. One is free for 12 months, as you can see here, and the other one is free forever, always free, 
and these are there are limited resources limited number of uh, options that you have but there are two options so in 12 months you get a little more uh, resources that you can use over time there are certain resources that aws wants you to keep trying and then if you like them you can use more so that's their hope and they would give you you know some aspects of free so you can click on each one of those to see what are the details in for example 12 months free you get these services for free for that many hours that much time that many hits so on and so forth for various services different parameters obviously and then for always free you can also check out here and there are other services which are always free beyond the 12 months period of course in 12 months period this will be included as well so those are the two aspects of the free tier once you are in AWS console, you will see that uh, the services are organized in, uh, in in groups. So you have, uh, let's see here, so you have compute group here. All the compute services are grouped together. You have management tools grouped together here. You have mobile services grouped together, so on and so forth. Services are grouped, so you can find them easily. That's one way. Other way is if you drop down on that services, you can do A to Z as well. Default is groups. You can do A to Z so you can find them alphabetically. So sometimes I find that easier than grouping because especially newer services, you don't know whether they fall under analytics or they fall under machine learning or uh, mobile services because they are pretty close to each other. So A to Z works better for me. But most importantly, what works best for me, what I end up using 99% of the time, is the search function here. So you just type in EC2 and then takes you straight to EC2. If you want to jump to S3, you can do that. Or over time, you're going to build history as well. So it will be only five services, last five services that you used. You can click on that or search. Once again, I find myself using search more. There are a couple other ways you can two as well one is see that pin you can pin a service so for example if you like to go to ec2 a lot we can pin ec2 all the way to the top and then you just scroll up and then bring them here if you like to go to s3 a lot as well you bring s3 through the top and then you pin that and now you can click on it and straight away go if you don't like them you can click on this and just drag them out um, let's say you are now using something else let's say you will use CloudWatch a lot so you bring that up you can do a few of those here this limited uh, real estate there but once again you can search and get into the services in number of ways easiest would be the search so now we are in EC2 service EC2 stands for elastic compute second generation of that service and EC2 dashboard contains not just the compute but a few other aspects supporting the compute such as uh, you have launch template for instance instant uh, the, the compute is called instance a server or it could be even workstation is called instance and then you have uh, ways that different ways to purchase we're going to talk about those in other lectures you have images for a which are called amazon machine images ami so you got ebs which is which are the volumes you got network and security so there are various sections within this ec2 dashboard and some of them we are going to be uh, talking about it in in different uh, different lectures as i said load balancing here auto scaling very important system manager for uh, operational aspect so all those things are here under ec2 will be launching this would be your probably most frequently used page of aws at least initially so that's ec2 let's go to s3 we can click here on s3 or search on s3 and this is S3 is your object-based storage, which is highly available, highly durable AWS storage services. And here you can create buckets, you can store objects, meaning files, uh, and then you can retrieve, you can create some policies around it. It's pretty straightforward, just create a bucket and we're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through 
S3 exercises to give you more details, but at this point, just wanted to give you a quick update. You can click on a bucket and you can see properties of a bucket, permissions, management. Um, also, if you want to, if you click here, then um, its properties and all those things open up on the right. But if you click on the link, then you get into the bucket itself, which are, has the files. So you can see all those files and you can also see different versions if they are there and you can look at all these other aspects individually and configure those as well but if you just want to see them you can click out here and it's anywhere other than the link here so what i'm trying to say is if you notice there is a link when you take your mouse here there's a link here so if you click there you go inside the bucket but if you click anywhere else here you open up this part of the s3 not a big deal you'll figure it out uh, over time but just wanted to point that out at this point so next thing i would like to walk you through let me see what we have here vpc vpc is virtual private cloud so once again i'm going to exit this and vpc will take me to virtual private cloud Virtual Private Cloud, we have a whole lecture, uh, several lectures and labs on VPC, but the concept is it's your virtual data center, not in your environment, but somewhere sitting out there at AWS secure and private environment just for yourself, though it is multi-tenant, but no other tenant, including Amazon, can come in without your permission. So it has a number of other things vpc has your vpc networking is part of the vpc main aspect of vpc is subnets and how do you organize your networking we'll talk at length on that there's internet access aspect how do you go to the internet and that's part of vpc dhcp elastic ip we'll talk about it's like a static ip addresses for your services netting which is private to public translation Peering with other VPCs, if you have multiple VPCs for uh, containment reasons, security reasons, what might be your reasons, you can then connect them to each other if the need arises or if it's by design, you can do so. So we'll talk about that. Uh, there are also network security aspect here, network ACLs and security ACLs, which are very important and they're part of the VPC configuration. Uh, or at least under the VPC section. And then you have VPN connectivity back home to your corporate network as part of VPC as well. So we'll talk about that. The next is IAM, one of the most important services initially, and an ongoing basis, I would say, is uh, identity and access management. Here you're going to create users, you're going to Let's say you're going to be creating users, you're going to be setting up some roles, policies, groups, assign rights to which user can do what, what services can do what. You can also bring in other identity provider, set up your account credentials of your users, change their passwords, set up multi-factor authentication for users, set up password policies. So very important aspect also gives you IAM login. Uh, generally, there is an account number. You can customize that, which I have done. Here it would be otherwise uh, some numbers for your account for AWS. And you can, again, customize has to be globally unique name. So once you have that, you log in through the IAM, not through the root user. Initial first user is considered root user. Rest of them are called IAM users, which you can give equal rights as the root users, but they are just not root users. Uh, and it's highly recommended, and we'll talk about it in IAM, not to use the root user, but to use IAM user along um, along the way. Okay, next is the Cloud Watch, which is the service for monitoring. So I can just type Watch, and then Cloud Watch comes up. So that's the monitoring backbone for the entire AWS uh, platform. All the services plug into the CloudWatch. CloudWatch gathered the statistics from your virtual servers, from storage, from all resources, most of the resources that you deploy. You can also deploy an agent for added intelligence coming out of your uh, system. So CloudWatch is going to be very important aspect. You can also 
trigger your auto scaling policy based on what CloudWatch is seeing and you can configure your uh, alerts and things like that out of CloudWatch so that you can get notified, you can get emails, you can get text messages or however you want to run your operation. So it's sent, it's very important service that goes across all of the AWS services for monitoring. The next one is a trusted advisor. So we would do trust and then trusted advisor is there. Trusted Advisor is a service that is um, uh, that runs automatically. It finds the the purpose of Trusted Advisor. There's a whole lecture on it, but the purpose of Trusted Advisor, in brief, is to help customers identify problems or opportunities, and uh, or or otherwise, you know, verify that they have a very good setup. Uh, you know, is checks and balances in. Uh, uh, five different aspects, cost optimization, performance, security. Let's see, so cost optimization, as you can see here, performance, security, fault tolerance, and service limits. So it identifies these five areas and what what is the configuration, what's not. You see some of them all show zero, whereas others, like this one, I'm going to do circle for those, shows some numbers because uh, these two are free they come in with the free basic support we're going to talk about that in support lecture and the other three you need to pay or get additional support such as developer or business or enterprise level support to get those checks um, turned on and then you can get insights into it if you go into securities it's saying that four are good one needs uh, attention and one is really really a threat so you need to fix it right away and similarly, in the service limits, it's saying, you know, all 39 are within limits. If you're approaching, you know, there are some soft service limits and some hard service limits in AWS. Um, you cannot just spin up 2 million servers in a day. So those are called service limits. So, you know, if you're coming close to any of those service limits, it's going to give you warning here um, pre proactively. It's not that, oh, it's too late, but you'll know ahead of time. And you can fit that information into your operational uh, software or through CloudWatch and take that data in. Okay, so next one we want to look at is billing. Billing is how much money you're going to pay and what are the opportunities for you to, to make some savings. So let's say billing dashboard is right here and you get into the billing and it's going to show you all the invoices the cost explorer um, what are the savings opportunity just like the trusted advisor but this is more on to uh, cost allocation like which department is, is using how much resources and what if you have any chargeback mechanism you can you can uh, uh, enable those here there are tagging mechanism where you can tag a department with a name and then you can do cost allocation based on the tags that you have enabled for each one of those uh, areas or departments or geography so a lot of ways you can uh, gather information about the cost and the billing here and a lot of good tools here available for cost savings uh, you can also send alerts to yourself about the billing um, that if you're approaching certain certain number or if you breached a certain number per of uh, spend that you expect to spend in this month uh, or maybe the projection for the next month you can do all those things from here and then i said we'll explore some other services so let's look at the services section here uh, you know there are labs and lectures on many of these if not all uh, so you're going to go into those to learn more about it. But, you know, in general, once again, compute services are here, such as Lambda services, Beanstalk, LightSail. These are automated. LightSail is an automated way of launching uh, 
either service or a server, such as WordPress service. Developer tools, you know, there are a bunch of those that AWS supports and maintains. Uh, machine learning, AR, VR, storage, you got S3, EFS, Glacier, and storage gateway solutions there. Uh, management tools, there are several that you can uh, rely on and use and really get insight into your environment, analytics, customer engagement, so on and so forth. There are uh, more than 90, close to maybe 100 services available on uh, on this uh, on this page and uh, it says there might be more. So, uh, not really, let's see, go back here. Services, yeah. So you can get uh, you can get number of uh, you can get uh, to any of those services here. You can once again do A to Z or grouping. A to Z will give you exhaustive, complete list of services history here, and then uh, the tags or the pins here that you can quickly go back to. So that's how you uh, explore the AWS services. There's lab on the resource grouping, and I'm not going to go through it right now, but you can group several resources, different resources, say one server, one EC2 server, one bucket, uh, one light sales service, one beanstalk, maybe one of your EBS uh, snapshot. You can bundle all those together in a grouping, just like, you know, folder in your um, in your laptop and then you put files under it. It doesn't have to be all the same TXT file, it could be TXT, PDF, mix and match and same thing here. So you can quickly go to your project, for example, uh, project resources without going to EC2 and then server and then S3 and then buckets so on and so forth. So it helps you organize and system administrator can push out those groups and others can use it and individual can also customize for their own usage. So that's uh, in just uh, AWS console. You're going to be making it your friend throughout your studies for AWS certification exam or for your uh, professional career. This is going to be uh, in front of you a lot, you know, a lot. Although as you progress, you're going to be start using AWS CLI and SDK and other automation tools. Uh, but until then, uh, and even after that, you're going to still go come find yourself coming back to AWS console a lot. So this is a great, great tool. So that concludes this lecture. Uh, thank you very much once again. This is Hello Cloud Search. My name is Casey Shaw. This lab was about AWS console for AWS certification preparation. Thank you very much. Let's look at this practice question. HCC AWS dash PQ dash one one nine six for AWS practice exam. Which of the following are advantages of the cloud computing over an on-premise computing environment? So advantages of the cloud computing over on-premises. Choose two answers. The answers are A and D. Let's look at A and D first and then the others. A, increased speed and agility. You would have to agree to that for the cloud computing, one of the main reasons. And D, stop guessing the capacity as part of the cloud promise. You don't need to guess capacity. Let the cloud provider worry about that. And they generally have lots and lots of capacity for multiple customers. So for one customer, you should not be guessing what the capacity of your application might be one year down the road, two years down the road, or, or next month because the capacity is out there for you to use and deploy and you pay as you grow, you pay as you use, you pay as you go. Let's look at the other choices, why they're wrong. Choice B, take educated educated capacity guess. You don't have to even have an educated guess, meaning you, you make a sound guess about AWS would be able to house 80,000 servers for you over the next two years. Yeah, that's educated guess. They would have they would have that capacity, whatever you're looking for. You don't have to make even educated guess. No guess is required in terms of capacity planning. Trade speed and agility for lower cost. You have to trade. Trade meaning give up one for the other. Speed and agility for lower cost, meaning you're going to get lower cost when you go to cloud computing, but you will have to give up. Trade meaning give up. Speed and agility, that is false. Speed and agility is also one of the main 
benefit of cloud computing. So C would be incorrect as well. Uh, so was B. And let's look at E. Better professional services. Is that the reason over on-premises environment? Probably not. Uh, professional services available in either case. You cannot say that there is better professional services available for the cloud. In fact, it would might be opposite because cloud computing is relatively new. So your answers are A and D, increased speed and agility, and stop guessing the capacity are the advantages of cloud computing over on-premises. We chose two answers. The degree of difficulty is 60. The 65 is about average degree of difficulty for a real exam question and all the practice exam questions uh, in my practice exams. So there you have it, question number HCC-AWS-PQ-1196. Thank you very much. This is Casey from Hello Cloud Search. Say hello to your future. Thank you. Let's look at this question ID HCC AWS PQ 1210 1210. Which of the following is customer's responsibility under shared responsibility model? Answer is A. Configuring IAM is customer responsibility. And we'll look at the table below here shortly. But let's look at other options. Compute virtualization of the host system that's AWS responsibility therefore incorrect this is customer maintaining security of the edge locations is AWS responsibility therefore incorrect for this question database installation for DynamoDB is a fully managed database no SQL solution therefore it's AWS is responsibility not the customer therefore incorrect choice degree of difficulty 65 right at the average for this exam now let's look at the shared security model here so you have this and IAM configuration is part of customer the tool is provided by AWS they manage they maintain but configuration falls under customer responsibility of security in the cloud by the customer so that's it for this straightforward question, AWS PQ1210. My name is Casey Shaw. Say hello to your future at Hello Cloud Search. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, let's talk about question ID 8, CC AWS PQ1244. The call of the question is where I like to start. What would you recommend a company reduce the amount of time it takes to complete a job while keeping operational costs down? A quick glance is about spot instances. So we got an idea what we are looking for. The company is running a fleet of EC2 servers supporting their big data application. Big data is a keyword here. That application is analyzing more and more data. They are hungry for additional processing perhaps because more and more data coming in. The company is fairly mature in the DevOps, mature in the DevOps based automation in AWS environment. What would you recommend the company do in order to reduce the amount of time? Reduce the amount of time it takes to complete a job while keeping operational costs in check. What would you recommend them? The correct answer is answer choice B here. Launch spot instances by spot instance launch visit. Use spot instances. Why would you say that? Because company is using more and more data they want, their goal is to reduce the amount of time, and it's a big data type of application. Spot instance is well suited for that. So therefore, the answer. Choice A, let's see why it's wrong. Launch spot instance by EC2 auto-scaling launch wizard. Uh, you, you don't have to do that. Uh, you can just launch spot instances from a spot instance launch wizard. Uh, launch a uh, spot instance by cloud formation stacks stack sets yeah, you can do that but it's much more purpose built um, the spot instance visit uh, launch reserved instances you don't want to go reserved instances when you have big data type of application unless you're running it all the time here you're probably running it when you have data and then terminating when your job is finished and restarting the cluster so you save and optimize on cost Reserve instance can do that for you for a steady state workload. This is not one of the use case for 
resolved instances. So that would not work. Launch spot instance using launch wizard is your answer in this case. That should do it for HCC AWS PQ1244. Thank you. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search. This is AWS Hands On Lab. The topic for this lab is EC2 for AWS, that is Elastic Compute, second generation uh, for Amazon Web Services. The lab ID for this particular lab is HCC AWS Lab 1034. The scale, difficulty scale is 60. 65 is average, so this is below average, easy lab, first version of the lab. The objective for us in this lab is to create your first EC2 Linux instance. If you have created one before, this may be reputation for you. You already know about it. You might want to quickly go through it or maybe not. It's up to you. But this is for folks who have never deployed EC2 instance. Uh, it's important for your certification training, whether it's associate or professional, you will need to know this. This is the basics of AWS. So once again, if you have done it, maybe more than say five times, you probably don't need to do it. But if you have done it once, six months ago, three months ago, you might want to go through it one more time here. Here are the high level steps. As in all the labs, I'll give you high level steps and I'll walk you through. Log into the console as an IAM admin user, not the root user. There's a difference there. IAM admin user. If you have not created one, go to that IAM lab and do that first. Go to the, then EC2 service and create an instance. Click on that and then follow the wizard. And at the end, it's going to ask you to create either a new key or use an existing key. That's the SSH key to log into the server. You can create a new key and um, uh, you can then download the key to your computer. I will be in this particular lab using Mac, but you can also use Windows. I will have a Windows version of the same lab available to you as well. So change the permission on the key to make it private. Uh, otherwise, system will not allow you to log in. And then you SSH into your um, server that you deployed. You need to find out the public IP address from the console. I'll show you how. Then you type a few commands to see the system is alive and well and working for you. Let's see what else we have. AWS certification relevance. Always all the aspects of uh, what we do is uh, certification training. And this hands-on lab it will help you if you are in, uh, in the business, in the profession, or trying to be a cloud engineer. We, even though you're not trying to get certified, it's going to help you. But for certification folks, folks who are trying to get certified, EC2 is a very important topic, right? One of the core topic without the server, uh, you may have some serverless and other applications, but for the most part, server is going to be um, one of the required resource for most of the services. And so it's going to be important topic for AWS certification exams. Approximately three to seven questions, uh, depending upon uh, what you get, your luck, and the, the type of test you receive for associate level uh, certification exams for AWS. Highly encourage you to do at least two labs, more likely maybe more than that, to be more comfortable with it. And then process of going through hands-on lab always, always reinforces and helps you become better at uh, AWS and uh, make you understand the concept, underlying concept, much quicker than without doing the lab. So I strongly encourage you to do several labs, not just for this topic, but other topics as well. For further support, if you have any questions or you want to participate in a discussion forum, we hold a free discussion forum you can participate in. You can send email uh, to get more support. Uh, you can ask question on uh, either a Facebook page or any of the number of platforms that I provide. Okay. And then references, if any. Uh, let's see. You can type uh, EC2 tutorial and limit to AWS site by this uh, site colon and you're going to get directly there or EC2 documentation and then it's going to take you there as well. 
So a lot of information on uh, AWS website for that. If you haven't done so, get your free to your access. And then based on this lab, try a few of your own scenarios as well. It's definitely going to help you. So let's go back up here. Uh, our charter is to deploy an EC2 instance. So let's see. So I'm going to be at the IAM login screen. That's my IAM site, my IAM username. I'm going to log in. And I'm logged in as IAM user to my IAM site for this particular account. EC2, we will search on EC2 and then get to EC2 service. And once we are there, as I said, either um, launch instance straight away or you can go to instances and launch instance. And I'm gonna select Amazon AMI, the default first one with SSD, T2 micro eligible for free tier, so you would not be charged. Take that as an option. So you can deploy more than one instances at the same time. You can say two or five or 20. Uh, you can request spot instances. Let me use my marker here. You can also request spot instances. Uh, we'll talk about that in spot. It's going to pick the default VPC that you would have when you start your account. So it's going to put this into that. We're going to talk about more in VPC labs and the lectures. Also needs a subnet, so it's going to put it in default subnet. Auto assign IP, it's going to use the subnet, so whether it will get DHCP assigned IP. In this case, my subnet has it enabled, which is a default, and um, you can change that. IAM role, you can assign, we'll talk about that, to this EC2 instance. And then uh, shutdown behavior uh, would be stop. Uh, enable termination protection, you can check this to so that no one can terminate by mistake. They have to override it so it wouldn't be terminated uh, programmatically um, or inadvertently through the console. Monitoring, you can do detailed monitoring from this screen as well. And tenancy default is shared. You can change that. You can do T T2 Unlimited uh, if you're interested in bumping up the performance, but this is, uh, then it, you'll be out of the free tier and you'll have to pay for that. So let's click on the next add storage. It comes with eight gig of uh, SSD GP2 type of storage. If you want to add volume, we can do so. Let's not do that. Adding a tag. We can tag this with a name. Uh, for example, name, we can say SRV01, our first server in this case. Uh, we can uh, put other tags as well. For example, department would be training. And then next, SSH. So this is security rule. By default, it gives you that create a new security group. It names it Launch Wizard 2. You can change the name. I do have an existing one, but let's just take the default here. Launch Wizard 2 is what it gave you. You know, um, you can change the name, but uh, uh, say SSH 2 uh, EC2 instances, for example. And then Review, Launch, and it's going to give you everything you configured. If you want to change anything, you can do so by going back here, uh, previous here, or go to up here. So you can make changes either by, let's see, clicking this previous button here, or you can straight away click on one of these previous links, um, section links to go back. Okay, let's launch it. And then it's gonna ask you, could you choose a, an existing key or create a new key. Let's create a new key, say so EC2 key, straightforward. And then you gotta download that key. The key pair already exists. So let's say EC2 dash master key. Let's make it a master key, EC2 dash master key. I'm downloading AWS. Keys, EC2 dash master key. Okay, downloaded it somewhere in there, and then we launch the instance. And you would go to the view instances, you're gonna see that it's gonna pop up pretty quickly. Launch 
SRV01 is spinning up. I have other instances that I can stop as well, just in case, let's see. I'm gonna leave that 100, I use that. Um, but SRV01 is the one we just launched. And the status here you see on the instant state. You may have different columns. I have probably customized this at some point, but no worries, it's pretty straightforward, just like any other web-based program. You can uh, customize the the columns there uh, somewhere here. But anyway, so we are waiting. So it's running already, server 1. Let's click on server 1, and that's the IP address or the DNS. We can take either. There is a copy. Let me show you. I'll use my marker here. This little copy icon here. Uh, if you see... Right here, it's going to pop up if I take my mouse there. Let's see. See that? So that's the the copy. You can just call, click on that or the IP address. You'll have to select and click it. So let's, let's just do this. Uh, copy the DNS, long name, but we don't have to type it. And we're good to go. So I'm using Mac once again, so I'm going to fire up my terminal. And we can, this is my, let's see, local terminal here, okay. And I'm going to go to that uh, directory where I saved it. The key, remember? Unless the key was EC2 master key. So we are going to do change mode 400 on EC2 master key. EC2 dash master key. Okay. So let's say uh, SSH minus I. You need to use username EC2. So you say EC2 minus I, EC2 dash master key. Then you have to use EC2 hyphen user. That's the default user, and then at sign, and then the DNS name, or we could have just put the IP address. I'll do both. So click on that, and we are inside the server. So host name, and we should be able to ping Google's DNS address. We should be able to ping AWS dot Amazon dot com. And we should be able to, let me clear the screen here, we should be able to yum update minus y sudo yum it's going to update the system so let's go back here um, so we went to AWS ping, uh, we did the sudo yum update and so on and so forth. So we are inside the server and it's building up and we we'll log in with IP address next. Demonstrate how that works. Let's see, go here maybe in another window and we do CD to that key. We need either it should be in the path or I need to get to that key like that, SSH minus I. There are ways to to add this so you don't have to type it every time. I'm not going to go through it in this lab. And then let's look at the IP address of the server. Let's copy that. And then we paste it here. And remember, we need to do EC2 user, EC2 hyphen user at the IP address and we are in host name ping okay we can also do CLS PWD we can do W get
then you can see cat so we downloaded the index storage HTML for AWS web page right there and we are in business pretty much uh, both sides here this is also our server and this is it if you're going to change the host name you can do so as well um, you know you can change the prompt you can change uh, um, you know, many things you want a ps1 for example equals to say my first aws server ssrv01 max slash w space dollar space so that you can have working directory as well so you change the name of just the prompt not the host name still remains what you had it uh, there are ways to change that as well look for the notes in ec2 section for a lot more things you can do here i'm not going to go through all of that in this first build out of your ec2 server so there you have it uh, really straightforward um, and you know we can real quickly do another one use the same key just launch uh, select and you can say just review and launch really and it will do the rest for you to just take everything default and choose an existing ec2 master key launch an instance and it's that straightforward we can name it later on right now it's going to come up without any name which is just a tag we can add it we can add it now say srv02 while it's pending see it here it's in the pending state it's gonna come up in uh, running state pretty soon running server 2 we have IP address here you can have it down there as well so with that I can jump to my local host here that's uh, my local system so I'm gonna change directory to my key SSH minus I EC2 master key ec2 hyphen user at ip address and it's gonna ask me for the first time and we are in and that's the host name you can change this to ps1 equals my second aws instance srv02 backslash w4 current directory space dollar space there you go so you this one was your this one was your first server zero one and this is your server zero two you can ping each other you can do so let's update that sudo yum update minus y it's gonna update itself so what did we do let's recap we said we are going to build out a server let's see and we logged into the ec2 we we went through the visit we created uh, one server and then the second one as well created a new key that we used for the second server downloaded the key changed the mode used the key for ssh um, this should have been an ec2 hyphen user at so i will update that and then we typed these commands to make sure that uh, we can log in successfully. And once again, EC2, very important topic for AWS associate level certification exams. So make sure you, you run through this and many other EC2 based exercises, hands on uh, labs, as well as all the exam notes that I'm going to provide it to you. So, um, Thank you very much. Once again, this is Hello Cloud Search. This lab was about AWS EC2, how to build your first Linux EC2 instance. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello, question ID 8CC AWS PQ1008. 
which of the following AWS service will give customers the complete control, complete control over the server instance from OS and above. So OS and above, complete control. The answer is cho uh, answer choice D, EC2, Elastic Compute 2, is a service from AWS that will give you that full control. Let's look at other choices. EC, incorrect. EC2 is the right terminology and the product name. E Lambda is a serverless. It will not, AWS will not give you OS and above access to that. RDS is a managed services. AWS will not give you shared access to RDS instances. EC2 is the right answer. You deploy the server and you can do whatever with it pretty much. And that's the uh, question asked here, OS and above. And that's end of HCC AWS PQ1008. Thank you very much. This is Casey Shaw from Hello Cloud Search. Say hello to your future. And this is part of AWS practice exam question. Thank you very much. Hello, let's talk about this question ID HCC AWS PQ1378. PQ1378. Which of the following is false? Remember, when there's a negative question, always keep that in mind. Uh, immediately notice which of the following is false about AWS. We're looking for three true answers and one incorrect. The answer in this case is C. C. Upon request and approval by AWS, customer may visit AWS data center in case of an extreme circumstances. That is incorrect. In no circumstances, AWS, this is a false statement. Therefore, correct answer. Under no circumstances, AWS would allow customers to visit their data center. Pay-as-you-go model, uh, that is true. So, incorrect answer. Highly scalable is true, therefore incorrect answer, and uses region and availability zones based infrastructure, that is true statement, therefore incorrect answer, because we are looking for a false statement. So that's it for this. Question number 8, CCAWS PQ1378, answer is C, degree of difficulty 60, the answer is upon request, AWS, even upon request, and even in extreme cases, AWS will not let you visit their data center. They won't give you the address. They won't let you know where it is. So that's it, 1378. Question ID 8, CC AWS PQ 1270. What are IAM best practices out of this list? we got to choose two. Answers are A and E, turn on CloudTrail audit to monitor IAM activities. E, use IAM roles to share access. Very important, both of these aspects, CloudTrail is your compliance aspect, compliance tool, compliance capabilities. It does all the auditing uh, for all the IAM related activities, SDK related activities, CLI console related activities. So CloudTrail should always be turned on, CloudTrail audit. So that's best practice and that should be turned on for IAM activities and that's the best practice for IAM. Choice E, use IAM roles. Roles are very important. The way it works is you have a policy document, JSON policy document. You apply it or use it on a role, just like you use it on a user or a group. Ideally that way, alternatively this way. And you can also have a service account the role gets applied to resources such as EC2 and that resource can access then based on the permission sitting in this document which is permission document based on that EC2 instance can have access to say, S3, DynamoDB or other resources within AWS environment. So that's the use of role, and that's very important. So role is no person, right? It's, does, it's not he or she or a group. It's, it's a thing, and you associate that. You can change the policy here that will be reflected in the role, and that is already associated. So you don't have to change anything. You just have to change policy here centrally. So that is very helpful. And that's the best practice. There are several best practices in this document. Make sure you understand them well for your exam preparation. 
degree of difficulty right at the average of 65 look at the thermometer to understand how I uh, scale this how I uh, come up with these numbers and what's the, the science and logic behind it so that should be it for this question HCCAWS PQ 1270 thank you very much welcome to hello cloud search say hello to your future this is AWS hands-on lab for identity and access management IAM the lab ID for this lab is HCC for hello cloud search AWS lab 1022 that's the lab ID this entire number here the entire uh, string here difficulty level is 60 uh, 65 is average so this is a rather easy lab version 1.0 objective is to create an IAM user and a group and we log in with that username so here are high level steps in uh, in these labs I'm not gonna give you each and every step I'll give you high level steps so it's sort of easy each and every step but it's not gonna tell you that uh, very precisely sort of screenshot by screenshot for that you'll have to pause the video watch the video again and try it yourself that's a better way to learn in my opinion so uh, you're gonna be logging in first as a root user let me walk you through at a high level and then you're gonna go into IAM as a service and then go to user you're gonna add a user while you're adding user you'll also create a group and add a group and we're gonna give permission to the group which permission and administrator access permission and that's called the policy we can apply that policy to that group and by extension to the user that you created so once that user has that access admin access we're gonna have to log in as an IAM user so remember initially we logged in as a root user now we created an IAM user so you're going to log in as IAM user but it's a different website different link to log in as an IAM user versus the root user so you'll have to copy the IAM web address uh, from your account the root account so you're going to go there copy it you can also customize it you will see what I have customized too has to be globally unique name and then you log out the root user log in as the IM user and then you browse around the AWS console um, and then you create two additional users that's your homework I will create one user you create two additional users and that's how we finish this exercise um, now what is the certification relevance all my hands-on labs I want to tie it back to the certification because we focus on certification and AWS certification in this case so I am is a very important topic it is one of the most important topics uh, of the AWS certification exams especially associate level exams expect anywhere from two to six questions and depending upon your luck and your test you may get two you may get three you may get six don't expect you to get uh, 10 or more you know like 20 or something out of 65 but that's ex approximate uh, number of questions you can expect which turn on I am may not be just creating a user or a group but it's going to turn on your knowledge of I am I highly encourage you to do at least two labs on this topic uh, for your associate level pre exam preparation for a professional level uh, you probably will have to do more than that the process of going through the lab even though for associate level certification exams you can perhaps pass it without going through any hands-on labs but it is my understanding and it is my experience that going through hands-on labs and I believe that going through hands-on lab reinforces your theoretical knowledge over the years I have taken and I've been certified with more than 25 various IT certifications and I can tell you that doing hands-on even though the exam may not actually require hands-on you can probably learn it without it and pass without it but it's it's going to reinforce your knowledge going to be more useful it's probably the right way to do it if you need further help there are a number of ways you can reach out to me and i encourage you to do so there's also a free discussion uh, forum for certification i encourage you to participate there as well and then references if you uh, Google 
with the IAM tutorials AWS. Uh, I like to put site colon aws.amazon.com so all my searches are only from Amazon but if you want to open it up to third party tutorials for, for IAM you just don't put that site colon and you'll get it from the internet. Um, now to remember to get a free tier access if you haven't done so already and based on this hands-on lab i would like you to uh, try and implement a few of your own see if you can uh, hack a couple of labs yourself okay so going back up here uh, what we have set out to do high level steps here uh, so we're gonna try to achieve that we'll, essentially the goal is to create an iam user and log in give them an administrator right and log in okay so uh, with that what we're going to do is we're going to go to aws uh, login page and i'm going to log in as a root user first because we don't have an iam user uh, although i may have one i do have one but let's pretend i don't and then you're gonna go to iam gonna type in the search iam and you're gonna go into iam and you're gonna click on users and then you add a user let's say user is student zero zero one Zero 01 student zero 01 and you want to give programmatic access as well as console access you can do one versus the other um, and that's fine too but you know if let's assume that we will require this account to access AWS both ways we can create a custom password uh, HCC rocks hello cloud search rocks user must create a new password let's unclick that for this lab in practice you'll have you should have a stricter password policy and must require you know special characters and whatnot but here I have not so let's do that and then I'm gonna create a group although I have one but I'm gonna add users to a group and that's what's selected and then let's say create a group let's create a new group so let's say admin group and then we can you know if you do just search on the policy you're gonna get all the admin policies up there and administrator access is the one I want to give you to this group so we added that group and gave that policy meaning that whoever is in that group would be admin and we are under the add user process and we added that group and then we're going to go next review that so user we are creating a student 01 and put in the admin group created the user and we are done with that at this point it is important to download this csv or show this these are your access keys so this is access key for this user and the secret key you will need that for cli based configuration for uh, using this uh, user as an access so and this secret key will only show here once so you recommend it i recommend you to download that csv and then you just save that csv so you have that access and in cli labs you will see how to use that for now we will not be using it and you can just close that so now that user is created the group is created if we check here uh, this is a new group admin group we created and we put the user in the group and we assign the role to the group see we have the group permissions administrator access and the user student one is in that group we can remove that we can add other users so on and so forth but that's enough for now we can now log in as that student 01 with hcc rocks as a password now uh, you see that account uh, right here that's your account number and uh, let's go back to im and you click on the dashboard and the dashboard here you know that number would have shown up here let me get my pencil in place here so this this one would have been a number before but now um, i have customized it and you can do so too so you can just click on the customize to 
um, I can because I have customized if I click on it, it's gonna remove it but if you customize you can put your own name or however you want to log in it's a sign in dot aws dot amazon dot com slash console and you just append your name so that's the URL I'm gonna copy here and uh, I can do one of two things I can log out this root user or I can open an incognito window and then I can copy paste that URL and then I can log in as that student01. And I should be able to log into the console and I should be able to go in uh, into services and create resources, delete resources. I have full permission because I'm part of the administrator access. So that did not work. Let's see. Maybe I mistyped the password. Okay, so it's trying to log in. If it doesn't work, maybe we'll change the password. So it did not work. I just want to show you live. It could happen. We go into the users. Uh, we created student01. We click on it. Security credentials. Let's say the password manage the password. Custom password h let me show you the password h c c r o c k s okay apply and then we go back to that h c c r o c k s that should log us in for some reason i may have mistyped the password but i just wanted to show you live so you can without editing this so you can see that it can happen and how to change the password or update the password and now we are in now we can just say let's say s3 we create a bucket under s3 if we have permission it let us do so bucket student 01 hcc is fine next just say next or create could have just created it next and create bucket on the very first uh, step there is a create button bypassing all the options as well take the default options and uh, you can create it that way quickly as well and go ahead and change the options but either way works so it's creating bucket that means we have the permission to do so if it succeeds then we know for sure that we do have permission it's checking for oh your previous request to get a name bucket succeeded and you already own it okay let's see refresh where is the refresh here so we can go back there's this refresh here on the right use my pen to show you it's a refresh button just for s3 you can also refresh the browser so it's created the bucket and you can drop the files here um, can select the file so essentially I don't want to go through s3 lab at this point but you were able to create a bucket and therefore you have s3 permission you have you can probably go into uh, let's say billing as well and as an administrator you can go there as well so we logged in as an IAM user from this point on uh, after you first log in as a root user create your first admin IAM user you're supposed to log in only as IAM user and not as a root user root user credentials uh, this one for example should be deleted so let's go to the users uh, uh, yeah I have another IAM user but if you go to root user credentials would be here somewhere and then uh, you can delete uh, the access key and the secret key for the root user because you shouldn't need those all you need is a console password for the root user so there you have it uh, that was the lab let's go back here uh, did we accomplish everything we wanted to we created a user as we said we added to the group we logged in and we have full access so that is the basic basic i am 101 lab just to create a user i am user and log in give administrator access and log in as that user that's it thank you very much once again this is hello cloud search my name is casey shah see you again bye bye
Question ID 1352, PQ 1352, which of the following is not, not an option for AWS Relational Database Services, RDS, not an option, negative question. So we're looking for what is not RDS, DynamoDB is not an RDS option. So when you open up RDS console, you are going to not find DynamoDB in there. You're going to find other options, but not DynamoDB. Aurora, you will find it there. So therefore, I would say true, therefore incorrect answer. True, therefore incorrect answer. True, therefore incorrect answer. You will find these three options under RDS, but not DynamoDB because it's no SQL. RDS is relational database, SQL database. So your answer is A, very straightforward, easy question, DynamoDB. Let me show that to you in IAM console, in AWS console. So let's go to, let's log in as an IAM user first. And then we go in there and look up for RDS service. So we say RDS, start an RDS database platform, let's say launch get started now and you see these options right here Aurora MySQL MariaDB Postgres Oracle Microsoft SQL DynamoDB would not be here because it's not relational database engine okay so that should do it for that question let's end off question HCC AWS PQ 135 Five, two. Thank you. Question ID HCC AWS PQ1014. The question is which of the following programming languages are supported by Beanstalk? AWS Beanstalk. The correct answers are A and B. A is Go and B is .NET. These are supported languages per AWS documentation. Other unsupported doc languages are C, Haskell, and Pro. Remember that there's a list of those in the description, uh, also in AWS documentation and the notes that I have prepared for you. So make sure that you understand, you know these languages, Java, PHP, Python, Ruby, and Go are supported languages for Beanstalk. So if you want to run application on AWS Elastic Beanstalk, you need to write in one of those five languages here. Two of the five are the correct answers. Let's end of this question, AWS PQ1014. Thank you. Question ID 8 CC AWS PQ1380. 1380. Which of the following is true about AWS Cloud Computing Environment? The answer is D. It supports Oracle DB in both. Bring your own license, BYOL, or license included models. So Oracle Database is supported. First of all, Oracle Database is supported under AWS, under RDS service of AWS. It's supported under two models, BYOL, bring your own license. If you are, if you are already an Oracle shop, you can bring your license to AWS environment, or you can consume Oracle Database in a license included model as well. So both options are available. Answer choice D. It does not support Oracle. That is false. It supports per second billing for all services. That's false about AWS services. Uh, there are some, most of the services actually are on a per hour basis. So yes, it supports per hour, but not all. For example, EC2 for Linux is per second. So Neither B nor C is fully correct answer, so they are incorrect. And only correct answer is D, Oracle Database. Uh, is supported in BYOL and license included model. One of the rare time where Oracle is the right answer. But this is more informational, not really praising about Oracle, right? So AWS exams, uh, I have said it in other questions uh, and other uh, lectures as well. A Oracle is very less likely to be the right answer in any AWS exam. But in this case, it's more fact-based. So that's it for this question, PQ1380.
All right, let's talk about this question. HCC AWS PQ1216. The company is embarking upon their cloud journey. Our CIO is extremely concerned about the security of their cloud environment. You are hired as a cloud practitioner. Which of the following should not, negative question, not be company's responsibility? So you want to find out which one is AWS responsibility. The answer is B, scalability of regions and availability zone should be squarely with AWS. You have nothing to do with it. They provide near infinite scale for their applications, for their environment, and you don't have to worry about that, right? So that's one of the main advantages of cloud computing is you don't have to plan for the capacity. You don't have to guess the capacity. Other options, IAM configuration falls on customers, so it's it is customer's responsibility. Question is, what is not customer? So what is AWS? I like to do it that way. When I see the question, negative question, uh, not very likely uh, in the exams these days, but if it does appear, then I like to convert that into positive. What is that you're looking for? So what is AWS responsibility here? And that is not Fault tolerance of application if deployed in a single AZ, that would be your fault. That would be customer's responsibility, not AWS. Application data at rest, you would be, customer would be required to make that safe. So correct answer again is B, scalability of regions and AZs is AWS's responsibility, not the customer's responsibility. That should do it for this question, HCC, AWS PQ1216. My name is Casey Shaw. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Question ID 1412. Which of the following is a true statement? Answer is B. The root user and privileged IAM users can create policies. It can be done by either root as well as privileged IAM users. That's true. Only the privileged users? No, root can also do. Only the members of the root group? There is no such group of, uh, it's called root group. Only the members of a privileged users group? Uh, no, root user can do it, of course, but not only the root user. So that's incorrect, that's incorrect, that's incorrect. Only keyword is incorrect. Either can create it. The correct answer is B. Degree of difficulty just above average. PQ1412. Hello, question ID 8CC AWS PQ1018. Which AWS service allows automatic deployment and termination of EC2 instances based on defined criteria such as CPU utilization of EC2 instances? Automatic deployment and termination. Keyword there, what service? Correct answer is choice D, EC2 auto scaling. Auto-scaling is a feature, a capability offered by AWS where you can automatically deploy your instances based on your set parameters, your defined criteria, number of instances you would like to run at a time, minimum, maximum criteria to scale up, criteria to scale down. We call it scale out and scale in. Scale out is adding more instances. Scaling in is reducing or terminating instances based on some criteria that you specify. It could be even schedule, but number of options available there. Let's look at other choices. S3 auto scaling, no such thing. S3 is infinitely scalable by itself. RDS auto scaling, it's not an option. RDS auto scaling. Elastic load balancer auto scaling, it's not an option. It's also automatically scalable. You don't need to do auto scaling policy or anything for that. So correct answer is D, EC2 auto scaling for automatic deployment and undeployment of EC2 instances based on a particular criteria that you define. So that's end of this question ID, HCC AWS PQ1018. Say hello to your future. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search. Thank you. Hello, question ID 8CC AWS PQ1160. The question is when comparing the TCO of the cloud computing with on-premise computing, which of the following should be taken into account in your calculation? 
The answer is answer choice A, facilities cost. Facilities cost should always be taken into consideration because that's the uh, cost you're going to have to pay to host your on-premises environment. That is a differentiator between that on-premise and the cloud where you don't have to pay facilities cost. It's included in per hour or per second billing uh, for the resources. Let's look at the other choices. Upgrade cost of old hardware for the cloud environment. Not so. For on-premises, yes. Only the initial cost of going to the cloud, not just initial. You should compare overall holistically. Only the migration cost. So only is your uh, keyword here that uh, uh, is making this choice not the right answer because that's one of the aspect, not the only aspect in C and D both. So correct answer is facilities cost should be taken into account for TCO comparison between on-premises and the cloud. That's end of HCC, AWS PQ 1160. Thank you. Question ID, HCC AWS PQ 1282. Straightforward question. Which of the following is true about IAM policy? IAM policy, what is true? It is a JSON formatted document. JSON is the keyword here. Answer B. It is not a Java program. It's not a Python. It's not AWS custom format. JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's industry standard format. So it's not AWS only. Other cloud providers such as Azure, Google Cloud, they also use the same format and other programming languages use JSON as well. So right answer, JSON, very straightforward question and that should do it for this. 1110, question 1110. Which of the following is a minimum AWS port which will give you 7x24 7 by 24 customer service not technical so basic will give you that business hour access to the cloud technical support developer will give you that allows two customer contacts business will give you that and offers architecture review of customers AWS environment now that looks like a full service and that would be a 15 grand a month type of service that would be enterprise so you need minimum to get all of this, you need minimum AWS. But as I mentioned, minimum, this is included in business. This, you need minimum of developer. For two customer contact, you need minimum of business level. And to get the whole enchilada, you need enterprise level support, 15 grand a month. And that's your answer. Degree of difficulty, 70. Important questions for certified cloud practitioner exam. Thank you. All right, let's look at question ID 8 CCAWS PQ 1032. Which of the following AWS solutions offer on-premise servers to be able to use AWS cloud storage solutions? So this is a hybrid storage use case. So you have, let's draw this environment. You have on-premises environment. So this is your data center and you want to leverage AWS environment here. You have servers sitting in your data center and the servers need to be able to use S3 storage solution. So how would you achieve that? And what's the product name? Product name is, answer is A, storage gateway. So you put a storage gateway on your premises as a virtual machine and that uh, presents itself to the other systems as an iSCSI mount point. And they mount it, they think they are writing here, but in the back end, the storage gateway is copying the files to S3 and fetching them from S3 as well. There are multiple ways you can configure that, but that's the solution you would use. EBS is not the use case for this. S3 is not. S3 is in the back end. You don't use S3 or any S3 type of device on premises. It's called storage gateway. Uh, like I said, S3 is used by storage gateway to store all those files, but S3 is not the solution you would use on premises. EFS is not a solution for this type of use case. Uh, for the back end, EFS is completely here. You don't install anything in your environment uh, for EFS. So this is a hybrid bridging your environment 
to the cloud, to the S3 in this case. So the answer is storage gateway, um, and that is a difficulty level 60, pretty straightforward, 65, and 65 is average, 70 is uh, also just above average. So this is where bulk of your question is going to come, 65 and 70, a few percentage from 60 and few above that. Take a look at the uh, exam thermometer, exam question, practice exam question, thermometer document, and a video to understand more how I calibrate this in all my questions. Thank you very much. That's end of AWS PQ1032 about storage gateway. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search, AWS Hands-On Lab. In this session, I'll walk you through EBS Hands-On Lab. EBS stands for Elastic Block Storage. The lab ID for this assignment is hcc-aws-lab-1058. Degree of difficulty is 65, which is right about the average. So if you know this, uh, how to do this, uh, it's right about the average. All right, once again, topic is elastic block storage. The objective of this particular lab is attach an EBS volume to an EC2 instance. We're gonna create an EC2 instance first, and then we're gonna attach an EBS volume. So here are the high level steps, as I always talk about in all my labs, at a very high level, uh, what steps we're gonna take, and we're gonna go in, and uh, I'm gonna go in and demonstrate that to you. And hopefully you can either follow along or do it at your own time. Maybe pause and, and, uh, and play and however you want to consume that information. Log into AWS console. That's the first uh, action we'll take using with an IAM admin user, not the root user. Deploy an EC2 instance. Uh, if you have, you can use the one you have, but in this case, we'll just deploy a new one. Go to EC2 dashboard and then go into EBS section and then we deploy an EBS volume and then in subsequent section we attach the EBS volume to the Linux EC2 instance. So those are the steps at a very high level that we need to take. Once we mount the volume, we're going to copy a file to it by getting the homepage of aws.amazon.com and we'll store it into this new EBS volume that we created. Now, why do you need an EBS volume? EBS volume is a block storage device. There's a whole section on uh, on the exam notes as well as the uh, summary section. So there are two videos for pretty much all the all these sections. So a lot more information there, but in a very brief uh, summary, I would say that elastic block storage is, you know, you can either boot from it, a lot of, uh, Amazon, AWS, AMIs boot off of an EBS-based volume. Or you can add it as an additional block storage. Um, one EBS volume can only be attached to one EC2 instance at a time. Although an EC2 instance can attach multiple EBS, in, EBS volumes, but one volume can be attached to only one EC2 instance. And you store the file. So and those files will stay even though server is terminated or stopped the EBS is persistent um, if you boot off of EBS that could or could not be persistent depending upon the choice you make uh, upon the termination of EC2 but the additional EC2 volume is going to be persistent you will have to manually delete it for it to disappear so you can save the data and then images can come up and go and then they can consume this or mount this volume to the images and then consume the data so that's the use case for it AWS certification relevance for EBS a very important topic especially important for associate level uh, CCP that is cloud certified professional for AWS as well as uh, associate architect and CSOP those certifications are heavy on uh, usage of EBS and I strongly encourage you to master the concept three to six questions is what I would expect in uh, associate level exam Highly encourage you to do at least two labs, if not more. And it's always very important to go through hands-on labs, though you can perhaps um, and definitely pass EBS and 
associate level exams without touching AWS console or EBS, deploying EBS, but you're going to learn twice as fast. It's going to be more relevant, more useful, and more effective for you, for your career. So go through these exercises. They're not really rocket science. You can do it. All right. So if you need any help, there are a number of ways you can reach out to me. And here are some of the ways identified. Uh, you can email. You can uh, participate in free discussion boards, blog posts, Facebook, and other means. References for this particular section um, or topic, EBS Tutorials, uh, AWS, with the site colon, will get you directly to the tutorial where you can do hands-on, uh, step-by-step, and then the documentation site. Um, and if you haven't gotten the free tier access, make sure to do so. And then, you know, based on this lab, you can create scenario two of your own. That would not be a bad idea. Okay. So, uh, with that said, let's go over to the, uh, we are going to jump to the AWS console. Let me start from the login. So, I'm going to log in as an IAM user to my IAM link, EC2. And we are going to launch a new instance, AMI, and then review and launch straight away. We're going to launch the instance. We're going to use the key I already have, launch the instance. Once instant launches, we're going to SSH into it. So let's give it 30 seconds or so. We already have the IP address, so we'll prep it. IP address is there for this new instance. Control C, Command C, I'm on a Mac. And while it's coming up, let's name it SRV03. So I have one and two, which are terminated, but still there for some time. It's going to show there, and then it's going to pop away. By the way, if you don't want to see terminated instances, you can, you can do some filtering here. So instant state only running. Show me only running instances. Um, so it wouldn't show, it would only show the currently running. So number three is the one we just deployed. Let's copy the IP address either from there or you can, you see down here, um, you can customize these columns, which I have done so. And once you have that, we're going to jump onto my terminal on my Mac. You can do it from Windows just as well. Look up some of the Windows uh, getting set up labs and the rest is the same. So let's see, we're going to do SSH, see which directory I'm in, the keys directory. So SSH minus I, EC2 master key is what I used. And then EC2 user at the IP address. And we are going to get logged in. We are inside the server now. So the next step the lab calls for is type this command. So we're going to mount, we're going to create a local folder and we're going to mount this new volume. So first we're going to go to this new, we're going to go to, uh, first we created EC2, we're going to go to this uh, EC2 dashboard and create a volume. So we're going to go here, uh, elastic block storage. So let me show that to you. So this is where EBS, this is E B. S, elastic block storage, so volume and snapshots. So we're going to click on the volume, create a new volume. Let's say just one gig, just for training, learning purposes. And volume type is fine. Just defaults are fine. I'll just say create the volume created successfully. And that's this new one. Let's a refresh. The new one that is just available, the top one. Let's call it uh, EBS volume 01. Okay, that's the one I just created, um, the EBS volume 01. Uh, let me just delete the other one so they are not. Oh, they're mounted in use, so cannot delete it. No worries, I'll delete it later. So that's the EBS volume that we just created. It's available, meaning it's not mounted anywhere. So we can mount it. We can say attach volume, and we can attach it to 
server that we want to. So this is SRV100 that's running. Uh, so you don't see our server and the reason for that is this volume and server are in not the same availability zone. availability zone that's the requirement so let's look at that so that's our volume let's go to the instances the new instance we created srv03 and that's in availability zone 2b us west 2b whereas the volume we created is in us west 2 a. So they are not in the same availability zone. So you cannot mount it. You cannot change this one either. So we need to create a new one. We just delete that and we refresh it and it's gone. Create a new volume, one gig. Here is uh, the availability zone. We're going to create in the same availability zone as our server 03 and then we create it and we name it don't have to name it this is just so we identify ebs volume 01 and we let's try to attach it now it's still building so oh that's not the one this is the one we just built EBS volume 01 and that's available to be mounted we say attach and we click on the instance and we should see our new instance that we launched server 03 SDF by default that's the first one slash dev SDF we keep that as default we say attach so now that volume is attached doesn't mean you can start using that Linux has to recognize that as well so once it is fully attached, let's see, it says in use, uh, refresh it, and it's in use, and it's all good to go. The EBS Volume 1 is in use. So now, now let's go to our instance we logged into. Okay, so we say SSH minus I, EC2 master key, and then EC2 user at let's find out the IP address of the instance which was SRV03 and this is the IP address and we put it here and we log in okay so we are logged in now we do those commands df minus h df minus h to see the partition the current mount points and we don't have the one we created we're gonna mount it there so we are getting ready for that so we'll do sudo mkfs minus t external 3 slash dev slash stf that's the mount point uh, the raw volume is there slash dev slash stf and we're gonna mount it with external 3 type file system so we're creating a file system so file system created and we are going to create a local directory you can create it anywhere i'm going to create under mnt so you say you sudo make directory slash mnt bs volume that directory doesn't exist so just just check it let's see um ls slash mnt and it's nothing there so we're going to create that directory that's just local directory now we're going to mount that abs volume in that local directory by this command mount nfs mount so now we will do mount with a sudo so with the root slash dev slash stf to that directory okay so we can just simply go mnt ebs volume there's nothing there we can copy either with a cp command or we can just do wget sudo wget http aws.amazon.com now we have that index.html file in there you can wget um, something else say http 
google.com it's going to create another index file there too so index uh, permission denied so we had to do sudo control a sudo and it's going to have another index html1 that's from google this is from aws so on and so forth you can also say co copy etc host to here sudo copy etc host here and then you can do ls so you got that file here so it's a full-fledged volume that you can move it to another server just like that you attach it to another server and that server will mount it and you can be moving that around as needed basis so that's pretty much it let's recap what we did um, in this lab we wanted to uh, we logged in as a non-root user, IAM user. We created an EC2 instance and we created an EBS volume uh, of one gig. And we mounted that volume to the new Linux server that we built. Uh, we first created file system, we created local directory and we connected the two here. And then we just cd to that directory and use it just like any other directory. But all this, the data is being stored on the EBS volume that you just created, which is actually here, this one, which is on that EBS uh, volume um, that we created in uh, the console. So that's the EBS lab, very straightforward, but you need to know some of these commands, though not for your exam preparation. You can just copy and paste. Uh, you will not be asked such detail exact command question that's not the knowledge being tested for the rubric published by aws for all their exams but it's good to to know that or have access to it so i've given that to you and you can try it and build a couple more ebs and attach it to different servers remember ebs volume you create and the server you create must be in the same availability zone for it to be able to mount it, otherwise you cannot. Not same region, same availability zone as well, okay? So there you have it, that's end of lab HCC AWS, lab 1058 for AWS hands-on on EBS for your certification preparation. My name is Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Service. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Hello, question ID HCC AWS PQ1154. Question is what type of EC2 instances will result in lowest cost of ownership, total cost of ownership for an enterprise looking into migrating their workload into a uh, workload that is required to be running for at least three years. Running to be at least three years. What type of instance you would choose for that? The correct answer is B, the reserved instance because reserved instance are our eyes more appropriate well suited for such a use case of steady state what is called steady state workload which is going to be running 7 by 24 for a period of time 12 months 24 months 36 months up to three years you should prepay it either a 12 month payment 24 months payment or 36 months payment to get up to 60 percent below the on-demand pricing let's look at the other incorrect choices choice a is dedicated instances uh, you do not need dedicated instances to run applications unless it's very specialized use case the information is not given so it's uh, dedicated host would you get dedicated host or the entire uh, underlying host that can host hundreds of EC2 instances, no. What type of EC2 instances will result in the lowest cost? Again, not enough information given for you to make that decision. On-demand host, that's uh, possibly the default choice, but because you're going for three years, you need to understand uh, the call of the question is about TCO. Anything is fine, but based on the TCO uh, requirement, you would go with 
the reserved instances as opposed to on-demand instances because that's going to save you a substantial amount of money. So that should be your choice. Answer choice B, reserved instances, RI. Keep in mind that AWS really likes RI. And uh, in uh, CCP, Cloud Certified Cloud Practitioner, and even the associate uh, level certifications, you're going to be facing with some RI-related questions. So, you know, keep in mind that RI is our favorite topic of AWS. And in this case, it makes sense. Three years, TCO better. So that's the answer. Reserve instance. That's end of HCC AWS PQ1154. Thank you. Question PQ1120. Which minimum AWS support plan provides access to the full set of trusted advisor checks? Full set of TA checks. Minimum you need is business support for that. Trusted advisor checks in security and service limit are available in all four. But the remaining, so these two are available in all four, but the remaining cost performance and fault tolerance these three checks not available you need business or enterprise to get this ta checks so the question is or oh, full set of full set many all five checks minimum you need is business support degree of difficulty right at average 65 and that's end of 11 20 thank you Let's look at question ID 8CC AWS PQ1034. The question is, which AWS service offers MySQL and Postgres compatible fully managed relational database service, RDS, and provides up to five times better performance than MySQL, MySQL? The answer is B, Amazon Aurora. Amazon's Aurora database is a relational database and provides all mentioned here. So MySQL and Postgres compatible, fully managed relational database service that provides up to five times better performance than MySQL. Other choices, DynamoDB is not uh, relational. It's not uh, MySQL database, it's no SQL. Microsoft SQL does not provide those benefits, and Oracle does not provide those benefits. It's not an AWS uh, service, so Oracle DB is part of SQ, uh, RDS as well as Microsoft SQL, but they don't provide these. Uh, all of these mentioned here, that's Amazon Aurora. So that's end of question AWS PQ1034. Pretty straightforward. Degree of difficulty of 60, 65 being the average. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello. Question ID 8CC AWS PQ1158. What does the term TCO mean in terms of cloud computing? Answer is C. TCO is total cost of ownership, financial matrix used to estimate direct and indirect, that's those, those two are the keywords, direct and indirect costs of products and services coming out of AWS documentation. Other choices are it represents only the direct cost, only the direct cost, not the right answer. It represents only, only the indirect cost, no it represents both. TCO is an AWS specific method, though this definition comes from their documentation. It's not an AWS specific. TCO is used in all, all sorts of industries, really. It has nothing to do with just the cloud computing. It is also used, it's a business term used in the cloud computing business as well. So answer choice C, financial metric. TCO is financial metric used to estimate direct and indirect costs of products and services. Very easy question. Degree of difficulty 60, 65 is the average. See the thermometer for how the range work in all my questions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Let's talk about this question ID, HCC AWS PQ1358, PQ1358. Which of the following is common feature capability of RDS and DynamoDB? What is common between the two? The correct answer is D. Both are highly scalable, 
services from AWS, very scalable, highly scalable, both of them. One is relational database, another one is no SQL, no, not non-relational database. Other options, both are relational, not true. One is non-relational, DynamoDB, both are non-relational, not true. RDS is relational, both support SQL, not true. DynamoDB does not support SQL. Pretty straightforward question at average degree of difficulty for this exam. And that should do it for this question, HCC AWS PQ 1358. All right, let's look at this straightforward question, HCC AWS PQ 1260. What are some use cases for identity and access management? Choose two in this case. Answers are A and C, manage access control for mobile apps with identity providers, and C, integrate with your corporate directory. So those are two use cases, or, you know, two of several use cases for IAM, I should say. So once again, manage access control, meaning who can and cannot access mobile apps with web identity providers. You can use IAM for that using SDS, and then to integrate with your corporate directory. If you have an Active Directory, Microsoft Active Directory, you can integrate that corporate directory into your IAM environment. And that's a use case for IAM as well. Other options, not correct. Low latency access to your environment. IAM cannot help you with that. Container services cannot help you with that. Provides key management. That's a KMS service. IAM cannot help you with that. So straightforward. A and C are the answers. That should do it for this question. HCC AWS PQ 1260. Thank you. Welcome. In this video, I'll talk about question ID HCC AWS PQ 1042. Which AWS product or solution allows a one time secure data transport of 10 terabytes from an on premise environment to AWS cloud environment such as S3 in case where the customer owns a 10 megabits per second internet circuit? So, customer owns a very small pipe to the internet and wants to transfer rather large amount of data. What can AWS do for you? The answer is a product line called Snowball. AWS Snowball is an appliance that they can ship you. It's a rugged storage appliance that you can connect to your servers, to your switches in the data center. Um, switch, server, Snowball, and transfer this data to the Snowball, ship it to AWS back, and they will put it in your S3 bucket once they receive it. Uh, they have Snowball, Snowball Edge, and Snowmobile, like 55 feet, pretty, uh, pretty big vehicle, 55 feet, not inches, we're talking about feet full-fledged truck that they will send to your data center, plug in multi-10 gig to your data center and transfer the data, hexabyte, petabytes and hexabytes of data can be transferred with a snowmobile. We're talking about different product than Snowball, but it's the same category of transferring customer data offline, not through the internet, but direct connect and then put it in S3 for doing further processing. Other options, direct connect, will not be sufficient because you want to transfer this uh, in, in, a, in one time. So if you want to do it over and over, yes, direct connect would be a solution, but one time, it's too expensive. S3 accelerated transfers would not cut it because you have very small internet circuit. VPC is you know, part of the solution, but it's not a product that will help you transfer the data. So answer choice B, Snowmobile. Uh, degree of difficulty 65, right about average for this particular exam. And uh, for more information, just look at the thermometer for practice exam questions. Thank you very much. Welcome to Hello Cloud Search. This is AWS hands-on lab session for S3. The objective is to create S3 buckets. The lab ID for this is HCC AWS Lab 1068. Degree of difficulty is pretty straightforward, 60, 65 is average. 
this is the first version of this lab. So these are the high-level steps in all of our labs. I will walk you through high-level steps and then I'll gonna, I'm going to demonstrate you how that works. And then you can do it yourself, uh, either follow along or do it subsequently or both. Log into AWS console as an IAM admin user, not as a root user. That's best practice. Important for your exam preparation for all your associate AWS associate exams. Create an S3 bucket, give it globally unique name. Cannot be duplicate of any other S3 bucket in the world, not just availability zone, not just in a region, anywhere in the world. So it has to be globally unique. Uh, do not give public access to this first bucket and then just access the new bucket from the console. You upload a file and just access it. Create another bucket, make it public, and find the URL and open it up from another browser. Really straightforward. And then delete these two buckets, all from the console. You can do all that from a CLI as well in another lab. We will do that. Now, what's the AWS certification relevance of S3 in general? S3 is a vast and very important topic. About four to eight questions. A lot of uh, under good understanding is required to answer the, those questions. Lifecycle management, policies, access policies on S3 buckets, uh, synchronization, replication to cross-account uh, uh, cross uh, access to uh, how to you know share secure files over S3, how to make static websites. A lot of things are important. Um, in certifications for uh, from S3, but you know it varies from certification to certification. For a cloud certified professional, general knowledge of S3 and what lifecycle policy means is important to know. You really don't need to go too much into S3 CLI or anything fancy. But then in the associate and professional level certifications, you definitely need to master S3 topic. Highly encourage you to do four laps on S3. That will uh, ensure that you understand the concept and you can answer those questions comfortably. The process of going through the hands-on labs, it's not mandatory for AWS associate level certifications, but you know I have 25 or so certifications over my career of 20 plus years, and I can tell you that just going through the labs help you reinforce the concepts that you may have learned theoretically and it, it it speeds up your learning curve you know you learn twice as quickly in my experience so uh, even though not necessarily required for you to pass say AWS CCP cloud certified professional or even CSAA in the architect certification uh, associate certification or sysops or devops or developer rather so it may not be absolutely needed but you know it's it's almost needed uh, in my opinion you should you should do this need help any uh, more support any questions highly encourage you to participate in conversations uh, I host a free discussion forum highly encourage you to join there a lot more labs and practice questions there as well if you need more uh, help from uh, documentation or tutorials, you can search um, uh, on Google and you're going to be directed directly there. And if you haven't gotten your free tier access, make sure to do so because uh, you can do this uh, lab for free. And based on this hands-on lab, I encourage you to cook up your own, you know, try a couple more of your own labs as well. So let's go back up once again, it's straightforward, creating two buckets, one without internet access and one with internet access. So I'm going to log in as an IAM admin user, not a root user. And I'm going to go to S3. I am going to bucket so let's go back here this bucket we gave no permission so we click on the bucket link to see permissions and we give no one no access to that one and even inside the bucket let's go to this CLI file we did not open it up 
to anyone. So let's see back to the bucket, CLI file. Let's look at the link there, copy the link, and then open incognito window to that link, and we're going to see access fail. Right? If the lab doesn't call for it, but if we wanted to make it publicly accessible, we can just do that. Read object, save, and we refresh it to see that object. And that's as simple as that. We remove that, and that object is going to give us once again, permission failure. Let's see what's the status of bucket 2. Let's go back to bucket 2, AWS overview file, and we give it public read access. And we should be able to pull that up here. There you have it. So that's S3. Let's go back to what we set up to do. Very straightforward. Create two buckets and within the two buckets we wanted to uh, set up uh, one bucket without internet access i mean yeah without public access the other bucket with public access we uploaded one file each and we verified that and there you have it so that concludes this lab hcc aws lab 1068 for s3 buckets creating a couple of s3 buckets give it public access to one and no public access to the other Thank you very much. My name is Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Search. Bye bye. Question ID 8CC AWS PQ1304. Let's talk about this question. Which of the following statements is true about EC2 spot instance? Spot instance, what is true? Answer is C. You cannot stop and restart an EBS backed spot instance. So, cannot cannot stop and restart if your spot instance is backed by ec2 it cannot be stopped and restarted in a spot environment so what are the other options a you can stop and restart no you cannot stop and restart that is the answer you can stop and restart ebs backed spot instance via console api or cli no you cannot do it period you can stop and restart ebs backed spot instance only via CLI, not true. You cannot stop and restart EBS-backed spot instance. Tricky question, generally you can, but spot instance you cannot. So there you have it, question number 8 CC AWS PQ1304, little tricky, degree of difficulty of 70, 65 is average, 70 is above average, Look at the thermometer document for more information. So once again, that is for question ID 8 CCAWS PQ1304. This is Casey Shah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. What minimum AWS supports? A minimum AWS support plan provides launch support for the customer. Launch supports, that's a lot of proactive action. That would require big bucks, enterprise level support. Minimum and maximum is going to be the same in this case. Launch support is not reactive. Three, basic developer and business are more reactive support. This is proactive. Proactive versus reactive. The only support that's proactive is enterprise. The rest are, if things are down, you get to talk to the support. They can accelerate and give you better SLA as you pay more money but they are still reactive. Proactive is only enterprise support. So this is a launch day, meaning you're launching a new application and they'll be standing by. You don't have to open the case. They're waiting, they're expecting issues and person will be assigned or a team might be assigned depending, depending upon how large a customer is, that is you, and uh, what's your support level agreement. You have, you have enterprise and then you have multiple accounts with enterprise or what and you will get appropriate support from AWS during the launch event. Only enterprise gets that enterprise support, 15 kilo a month, 15,000 USD, and that should get you that support. Table is below. Thank you very much. Question ID HCC AWS PQ1166. 
1166. Which of the following AWS services can be penetration tested? Not all AWS services can be penetration tested, only some. Which? Choose two. Answer choices C and D. C is CloudFront and D is API Gateway. Those are the two services out of this that can be penetration tested. Beanstalk, not so. S3, not so. All Route 53 services, now only uh, DNS walking. So let's see the list should be down here. Yes, so there you have it. The list of services that can be penetration tested. These are the list of services. So as I said, not all Route 53, just the DNS zone walking can be penetration tested. So there are about eight services here. And that should be the answer for this question, PQ1160. Thank you. All right, let's talk about this easy question, HCC AWS PQ1200. The question is what approach from AWS documents and discusses the allocation of customer and AWS response security responsibility. So what approach from AWS documents and discusses allocation of customer and AWS responsibility. So that is shared responsibility security model. The shared responsibility model that AWS has published that allocates what is owned by AWS in terms of security and what is owned by the customer. Jointly, they will make the customer AWS environment secure. So they have a few things they will do. Customer has few things they need to do jointly. It would be secure environment that would be not easy to penetrate, compliant with many standards, so on and so forth. So shared responsibility security model is your answer. Other options, security model, not the right keyword. VPN model doesn't exist. Key management model doesn't exist. Straightforward question, definitional, shared responsibility security model that's the answer for this question straightforward simple degree of difficulty at 60 not too difficult question that should do it for this question number aws pq 1200 thank you very much question aws pq 1314 what is true about billing answer is d per second billing for ec2 linux instances per second billing for only EC2 Linux, not Windows, not per hour for Linux, not per second for all instances. Per hour for Windows, per second for EC2 Linux, straightforward question, at average degree of difficulty, 1314, thank you. Question ID AWS PQ 1422, 1422. Question is the company has decided to embrace cloud computing and start their journey towards the hybrid cloud environment. The DBA, database administrator, wants to leverage RDS for MySQL from AWS for their applications. The storage expert needs to know which of the following is true. So company has decided to go to AWS. The DBA wants to use RDS but the storage expert in the company wants to know what is true about perhaps the storage. The right answer is B. DB instance storage disk type selection should be made by the storage expert. So the company makes the decision, not AWS, that is true. DB instance storage type selection is made by the company, not AWS. Let's look at other options. The selection is made by AWS, actually C incorrect a db instance storage type is not customer's choice because it's a fully managed incorrect even though it's fully managed customer decides instance type and storage type db instance uh, choice d db instance storage disk type is adjusted automatically no it, even though it's fully managed service it's not as fully managed as dynamo db so storage expert will make this decision in other words customer doesn't have to be that particular person it could be dba it could be company somebody else but the point is the company makes the decision not aws and it's not done automatically either 
So that is it about this question, AWSPQ 1422. Thank you. Hello, Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sits. In this segment, I would like to walk you through my outlining process, the approach, how it works, what is it, and should you use it or not. Okay, so let me give you some background. I have lots of writing experience, two decades of it. I'm also admitted lawyer in State Bar of California, as well as patent attorney with USPTO. So over years, I have developed this outlining technique of my own. In the law school, outlining is very common. However, I have sort of mixed the law and technology in my methodology of outlining, and I'll walk you through, and it has worked very well for me. I, I manage enormous amount of information using this approach, and I can easily find what is where and recall things that, you know, once I knew very well, but I don't anymore because I, you know, have so much uh, limited uh, uh, real estate here, so I need to make sure that I, I use my outline efficiently. So I'm gonna walk you through the process and if it works for you, if it's something interesting for you, uh, you should try it and see if it works. And I can assure you that over time you get more and more efficient. So uh, give it some time if you if you uh, ever give it a try. And it's absolutely optional. If you're not interested, just click on the continue and move on to the next lecture. But it has been very instrumental to many. I have received very good feedback and I can tell you that. Um, you know, it works really well for me because, you know, I have uh, multiple cloud certifications. I'm a lawyer. I have a technology, I work in technology space, and I do many, many things. And there's no way I can manage that without this approach. So uh, I want to share that with you. You know, this is a million dollar approach, uh, if you will. Just kidding, but it, it could be really important for some of you. So here it goes, right? This document is available to you as a PDF download in this lecture as well as in the resources lecture. Okay, so what I have for you are templates for Google Cloud, AWS. I'm working on Azure as well. It will be updated for you. So the start with the template. It has all the topics that you need to know. And this covers all certifications for Google Cloud, all certifications for AWS. Now, they all come up with new products and services, but they don't necessarily make it into the certification exam for a year or two or even more or never, depending upon the, the type of product, right? Uh, however, if you find that some topic is not in my template, go ahead and add it. Let me know. I will add it as well. This is a Google Drive document shared publicly, so you can download it as well. Links are available in this document, and this document, once again, is available as a download to this lecture, as well as download in the resources lecture, right? So I'm going to click on that uh, momentarily, but let me walk you through uh, what I'm trying to suggest and see if it makes sense to you. I recommend copying, first of all. If you're doing Google Cloud certification, go ahead and, and click on the Google. And if you're doing multi-cloud, you can download both as well. Uh, so I recommend copying this outline. You know, you can copy on Google Drive. You can copy from my shared drive to yours and make your own or make a copy of that. That's fine. You will not be able to update this one because it's a read-only. Uh, I have shared it in a read-only mode. So you can download it, uh, you know, as a Word file. However you want it, consume it. That's up to you. My recommendation is keep it on Google Drive so you can update from your phone. Uh, you can update from your tablet or uh, anywhere, right? So the standard benefit of cloud computing applies there. So start with the above outline for all topics, and that's again just the template. I'll go through that. The goal is to build this outline along your learning journey, right? So you're gonna you're gonna fill in the blanks. You're gonna put information as you learn, and what my recommendation there is the following: the key is to keep a good balance. This is the key. A lot of times, myself included, when I was new to the outlining, everything I found, I put it in the outline. And then it becomes a book and you never read it, right? So the goal is to strike a balance between not make it a book, but make your own outline, make it your own document that you would want to refer, right? So something that is not obvious to you when you're putting it in, right? If it is, uh, you know, 
to you know to the sky is blue you don't need to put it in there right if it's uh, today is monday you just don't need to put it in there uh, you want to make sure that you strike a good balance right how would you strike it's so only add information that's new to you at the time right uh, you will learn along the way what is new today will be obvious to you in the future and i talk about that later uh, but it seems to be important for your certification exam right so again if it's something that is cool you know mit researchers ran 220,000 cores on a thing you know in the google cloud that's very good news but it shouldn't go to your outline that's not important for your certification exam that's important maybe you should go to your uh, OneNote or Evernote or Cape or however you want to store your information there right it doesn't belong to your outline for certification exam preparation keep that in mind right now if it is obvious to you while adding no need to add it right as I mentioned if it's very obvious even while you're adding it remember in the hindsight a lot of these things will be obvious it's okay to add it now but if it's obvious at the time of adding doesn't add any value to this outline don't do it for example i've given an example cloud computing is growing and more and more companies are using cloud computing well if it is new to you um, at this point I mean dramatically new if you are really changing your field from accounting to it sure maybe even then i would question this is common knowledge right you don't need to write that information that cloud computing is growing this is more this is this note is not worth adding to your outline because it it should be obvious to you and like i said if it's even if it's not obvious it doesn't make sense i mean it should be common knowledge and it doesn't belong to certification exam preparation outline on the other hand, if you come across something very difficult, you know, you, you came across some command that deploys virtual servers in AWS and Google and Azure, and, you know, right now it's new to you, maybe down the road it wouldn't add it in to your outline so that it is not obvious, it's something you want to recall. Right now it is you know, for you, a lot of times it happens to me, I feel that, oh, I know this stuff, you know, I don't need to write it, but month later two months later when you move on to other things you forget what that was right so you want to put it in your outline so you can go back to it you don't have to search the internet internet has uh, uh, you know a lot of information and it's now a problem of really filtering the right information and that takes time you don't want to waste your time there um, okay so if you come across uh, any relevant picture or screenshot i'll show you the template um, which makes sense again same principle it's not obvious to you and it's worth uh, the space in your outline remember goal is not to make it a book goal is to contain your outline to a reasonable number of pages that you want to refer to it you want to go back to you know search on it, right so if the screenshot uh, you can take a screenshot of a picture or you can uh, you know just right click and save the picture and then paste it in your outline now i have a specific outline format you know i just use uh, the bullet list with the indentation so you know where you are you want to see uh, you know i believe in uh, see the forest and see the trees oftentimes i just want to see the forest at a you know very high level view but then other times i want to see the trees i want to go deep down i want to see even the leaves of the tree right if that's the case right you want to have your outline you want to be able to zoom in and out so it's designed in that way that you can go if you're in compute you want to go now deep into auto scaling and now deep into the timers of auto scaling right so you know that you are in the forest of uh, say google cloud or aws and you're auto scaling and you're down that level so you can up level it also if you want if you just have all the information everywhere it's going to be hard right so if you come across screenshot put it at the end of the document i have that for you and you can uh, do like internal linking on a google drive as well so it's just link from there to there or just you know put some notes that you can search on it that this is a diagram or a graph or a picture for something you know this topic and then you can search on it to get there uh, and you should take screenshot from the CLI you know from the command line or whatever however you are consuming this information i personally use TextMeth snagit for screen capturing it's really good i've been using it for over 15 years 
uh, Mac and Windows both have uh, built-in screen uh, screen clipping software uh, you know with the keystrokes and stuff you can use those if that work for you um, but you know for $25 uh, I think uh, Snagit is a reasonable software it, it works for me but it may not it may be overkill for for you if you're not gonna use it that much but I use it a lot so um, once again take screenshots and what what you need to to do that to, to because you know once again this information is very useful to you at this point if it's not obvious you want to take at least you know a clip of it put it in there again I'm gonna show you what you should do over time you should trim it out as well right but at this point you should put it in if it makes sense to you all right uh, you should be able to read this outline and recall topics that are important for certification exam or professional use and these topics are hard for you now or were hard for you at the time at the point in the past right so I as I mentioned before you want to make sure that uh, you only clip and put what is important to you again the same message reiterated however over time Right. So let's say you are taking, you're studying for, I'll take, you know, uh, three examples. You're studying for Google certified uh, cloud professional architect and you're studying for AWS Solution Architect Associate and you're studying for Azure uh, Architecting Azure Solutions, right? So those three exams or any one or combination thereof, right? So you start three different outlines and you start adding material. Now your exam is next week for those one of those topics and you're going through the outline. At this point, what is obvious to you you should remove it, uh, meaning it is second nature. You already know this is now laughable that, you know, it's in your outline in a way, not not quite laughable, obviously, but you think that, oh, I didn't even know that. And that would happen. It is likely to happen. It should happen. That means you're learning. You're learning new material. You know, uh, in the past, you did not know. Now you know this stuff. So uh, that happens to everyone. But what I recommend is you trim your outline, right? You may have 20 page or 30 page outline. You should trim what is obvious to you and what is not what you're making mistake right you do all the practice questions that I have all the other instructors have all the other material that you're gonna come across in your preparation it's in there and based on that now you're studying and then you trim out so your outline the way it would it would happen is initially your outline would grow and then as you get closer your outline will go back it will start shrinking because now you know so much that you didn't know not that you ha don't have enough material now you know this stuff that you didn't know before so more it shrinks more you know in a way but don't cut it too much because think about it that what you what you know now or what's in the outline for solution architect uh, associate certification will be necessary or baseline for professional certification so when you go there you may forget depending upon you go next month or next year or two years later right so you want to keep some of that but you know trim responsibly but think about this formula that you're gonna sh grow and then shrink so it's manageable it's in less number of pages and something that is important and relevant for you it has worked miracles for me I'm telling you I've taken you know like I said taken many 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 exams and uh, without this process it is next to impossible now for me I use this method even if uh, I'm writing a, a document I'm writing a speech or I am um, you know doing anything literally you know planning an event even I start with an outline uh, so everything is for me starts with an outline pretty much everything and then I flash it out I look at the forest I look at the trees and, and and the leaves sometimes so that's my approach now let me show you the links here so we can take a look at together and I show you what I mean so I'm clicking on Google Cloud link there and then while it's loading I'll also click on AWS and like I said I'm working on Azure template as well so in here let's start with Google here so you have the template here is a view only you can uh, you can download it's a file and make a copy or download as um, there's also a way to save it to your uh, share drive as well 
um, he will find it somewhere there. But those are the options that would work. And I have kind of anchors here for the rest of this. So in the beginning, it's just right here, the beginning of the template. But you can also, on a Mac, just uh, click on it and Option Enter will take you there. Uh, similarly, on Windows, uh, Control Enter. Uh, so beginning of the template. And I have, like I said, forest and the tree view right so you see here uh, beginning of the template i have very high level cloud computing uh, topics here uh, and then you have architecture networking compute so it sort of builds on and then i have also indentation for various topics within that so these are my trees or leaves and then maybe this is leaf this is my tree this is my forest right so things like that and then you find some information about it put it in here and then like i said if you have a, a screenshot it's at the end you can also go from here option enter takes you to the screenshot you can just copy and paste um, say i want to take a screenshot of this screen right here i just take this and then paste it here right so that's just a screenshot then i just paste it uh, so that's uh, that's a gist of it for example let me give you a concrete example right so you came across a uh, information like i said cloud computing is great you don't need to put it here but you can say that uh, hybrid cloud computing is more prevalent in the industry today okay let's correct the spelling prevalent for example okay uh, compute cloud computing google cloud you can say that google cloud uses the same infra for their gmail youtube for example and that may be new to it was new to me and it may be new to you at this point right uh, for vpc for example right something that's uh, interesting to you say a range for cider is slash eight to slash 29 for example and uh, that's new to you but you don't have to say that vpc stands for virtual private cloud now this should be obvious if not you can write it now and hopefully in a day or so you should be crossing it out you can also use the strike out method that i use like for example you can select it here and then format text strike out you can use that uh, shortcut as well so you know that this is not important eventually you can delete it maybe you can take that as a first step before you delete and then eventually if you're still comfortable then uh, delete it or just unstrike out make it normal if that's what you want to do similarly in aws right you can uh, you can go to aws and and say that you know um, identity and access management iam roles can be applied to resources for example you know that may be new initially things like that whatever you're learning you go to the website and you come across something so let's say you you're searching on google cloud say google cloud command to create a virtual machine and you enter and let's say you come across creating virtual machine instance and you go in there g cloud command right there so g cloud g cloud compute instances create let's say this command i want to write down either you can copy the command or you can also do like a screen share uh, screen screen capture and then go in there remember i told you screen capture should be put at the end so it doesn't destroy your format and you can just add there and in the compute section i put it in aws by mistake go to google and you go here and then put it in there and then in the compute section you can then say let's go to compute section create a vm from g cloud this is screenshot or you can at least you can also say g cloud compute instances create for example that would be your command right so you can just say dollar 
something like that right okay so the point is just make it your own and that should help you all right so this should do it for these outlining sorry it was a bit longer than i expected but i wanted to give you all my mind music my insight what's going on why i came up with it again very optional uh, try if it works for you it has worked very well for me and many of my learners um, and if it doesn't work uh, just use your uh, current method not a problem uh, just continue on and if it doesn't work, uh, then you can stop using it as well. Thank you very much. Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. Let's succeed together. Thank you. Hello, Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. In this video, I'll talk about my offer for one-on-one -on -one free guidance to my active Udemy learners. Who is an active Udemy learner? Active Udemy learner, in my definition, is one who posts five times in a QA section of Udemy or any other combination thereof on any five different channels listed in my communication channel. Right? So you can post all five questions here or answer five times or ask questions five times or uh, ask for clarification five times or you know uh, help others five times whatever that may be or you can post three questions here and two on the facebook page or you know tweet a couple of times whatever combination once again you have to be just an active learner once you are an active learner you have earned one hour of free one-on-one -on -one guidance from me what are the use cases for this some of the use cases that i have thought through right for example number one if you're doing a hands-on lab and you're stuck, you cannot move forward, you looked up, uh, you looked around on the internet, you cannot find an answer, you looked at my solution or you're trying something different than what my question and solution is, that's fine, totally acceptable, encouraged, in fact, in all my labs. So you're stuck and, you know, that's a good use case. You know, you can call a friend, call me, call a, a Casey, call the instructor, and we can get online, we can share the screen, we can talk on the phone, and we can resolve the problem and get you move forward. Another use case I've thought about is you just need motivation. You just want to move forward, you're stuck, you're not motivated, you need some inspiration. Well, phone a friend in Casey, I'll be there for you. Let's talk it over, I'll get you energized to move forward. You know, a lot of people are making a lot of money by becoming cloud certified. If you get cloud certified, especially multiple cloud certifications, you are going to design your own compensation package for the next few years. I guarantee it. So get on board, I'll motivate you. Number three, if you're taking an exam, for example, uh, so your exam is, actual exam is next week, and I want to make sure, or you want to make sure that you are ready for taking this test, you're adequately prepared to pass it. You know, you we can get on the call, we can get on a, a shared web session on Zoom, and I'll quiz you, I'll you know, test you, uh, make sure that you're ready for this exam, right? So that's another use case. And again, you know, these are some of the use cases I have thought there is no uh, real limitation as far as you're making progress towards achieving the outcomes that you have signed up for i am here for you i'm fully vested why am i doing it well as i mentioned in my introduction this is a passion for me uh, i am not doing it just for the money the day i start doing this just for the money i probably will stop doing this uh, you know honestly this is uh, this offer is far more than any amount of money you have paid for this course i know for a fact right so i charge maybe 300 dollars an hour on an average for my consulting fees uh, in many cases and i'm sure you have paid way less than that for this particular course so uh, it is a huge value uh, the reason i'm mentioning the numbers is i want you to take advantage of this offer right this is very unique offer uh, I don't know any other instructor on Udemy offers such, um, you know, uh, has such an offer. Um, so I would like you to take advantage of that for your benefit. You know, like I said, I've been saying it in this course and all my courses. Let's succeed together, right? We are in it together. I want you to be successful. It's my passion and I want to learn more out of this and create more courses and more material for, you know, other learners from this experience. I want to make sure that i'm there for you so 
take advantage of this very unique very generous offer you know it's like a phone a friend when you're stuck one hour of free guidance you can break this down by the way it doesn't have to be one full hour you can break it down in two 30 minute session there's a pdf document attached to this uh, lecture as well as in the resources section make sure to download that to get more detailed information about how this works how to schedule and the logistics behind it really happy to offer this to all my active udemy learners i look forward to see you and let's collaborate thank you very much Casey Shah. bye bye Hello, Casey here from Hello Cloud Search. Say hello to your future. In this video, I'll talk about AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam information, what CCP is all about, and some related information. Okay, so let's get started here. Uh, AWS Certification Track. Let me give you broader stroke. How? What are the AWS certifications out there? So if you see the CCP is at the base of all AWS certifications right here so aws cloud practitioner cloud practitioner it's at the base of all the tracks they have three different tracks maybe actually four so one two three and four i'll go over that quickly so they have what is called this uh, associate architect track so certified cloud preferred practitioner at the base then you have solution architect associate solution architect professional then you have, again, base at CCP and developer associate and DevOps engineer professional at the professional level. So they have different colors. The gray color is for associate and the orange and gold color is for professional level. And then once again, CCP down at the base, you have sys system operator, administrator, associate level. And you have the same DevOps, so they don't have a separate CSOP to professional. This is the same certification, just like this is same across the four, across the three pillars. And then you have specialist uh, certification in networking, as well as in big data. Security was recently in beta, so we expect, uh, I expect security certification to be announced in the near future as one of the specialist track. So there are a total of eight certifications today. Ninth one, probably the security one. This is one, two. This is generally the order uh, you should address. So one, two, three, four. Then you can do this fifth. Then you can do this sixth. That one, seven. And this one could be the eighth. Okay. I will say this. Uh, the tracks, I'll highlight them differently. These are sort of pillars and eight certification exams. You can take it in that order. That would be my recommendation. You can go in in any order, but you cannot do professional before associate. They won't let you schedule that on the scheduling system. But otherwise, you can do developer ahead of, uh, you can do number three before two or four before two and vice versa. Okay, so once again, CCP, this is all about CCP. Uh, it is at the base of all the certification, the most basic certification. I think everyone should get it. In uh, some of my videos, I say age 12 through 72, everyone should get CCP because it's not only AWS uh, knowledge that you will gain, but you will gain cloud computing knowledge in general because uh, the CCP has one of the, you will see shortly, one of the domains as cloud computing, which has nothing to do with, uh, nothing specific to do with AWS, really. So everyone can benefit from that knowledge. 5, 10, 15 years later, knowledge of AWS and knowledge of cloud computing will be like knowing Gmail today or knowing uh, Google Drive or Dropbox or, you know, your touchscreen phone today, which we didn't know 10 years ago how to operate, right? So knowledge of cloud computing is going to be essential for all of our success. And I strongly recommend everyone to go and do AWS CCP certification um, at this point to get a front seat in this happening place happening area in the information technology space and in just about any space really the cloud computing has use cases for all types of businesses so you can benefit from it at this point all right let's look down here uh it'll be a ccp audience what is 
Amazon recommending in terms of who is the audience. In my opinion, like I said, age 12 to 72, everyone is an audience. But what does AWS say? Let's say it's intended for individuals who have the knowledge and skills necessary to effectively, yes, you need knowledge to pass this, but to qualify or who, who this is intended for, in my opinion, once again, 12 to 72 year age, everyone should get this certification. Candidate overview, who is the ideal candidate? Exam validates and examine his ability. So this is rubric essentially, and we'll see down here in terms of domain, but this is a rubric. You need to define what AWS Cloud is and the basic global infrastructure of AWS Cloud, AWS Cloud architectural principles you need to know about, describe cloud value proposition. I do that in uh, several lectures. Describe key services on the AWS platform. I have several lectures on those. Describe basic security and compliance, uh, cover that as well. Define billing and account management, cover that as well. Identify source of documentation. I provide that to you in multiple forms, links as well as PDF. You'll have the access to that. Describe basic core characteristics of deploying deploying and operating AWS Cloud. That's sort of inherent in a lot of these lectures and a lot of the notes that I have provided it to you. So all these topics I have covered in various formats in terms of exam summary notes, in terms of uh, short questions, in terms of end of topic quiz, in terms of hands-on labs, in terms of practice exam questions, so on and so forth. So you'll have plenty of opportunity to master this material and prepare yourself to pass this uh, not very difficult exam. CCP is all right um, exam, um, but uh, it's a good start. You will get your confidence, and uh, you still need the right material to study with and uh, study the right way by going through some hands-on labs um, yourself. All right, let's look at the exam outline. This is what AWS has provided for CCP. There are four domains. First one is cloud concepts. Second one is security. Third one is technology. Fourth one is billing and pricing. So your exam is broken down in these four sections. This is the spread of questions in your exam, right? So if you have 100 questions, you'll have 12 from this, 36, 24, 28. You don't have 100 questions, but just saying it's so 65 questions in this exam. So these are the percentage spread across those 65 questions. And then they have further defined domains down here. So let's take a look at that. Domain one, cloud concepts. And there are subdomains here, define AWS cloud and its value proposition, identify aspects of AWS cloud economics. A lot of questions and concepts you need to learn about why cloud and why is it economically better, pay-as-you-go model and so on and so forth. List the different cloud architecture design principles. So I cover all of this in various lectures, security at the front and center of all cloud deployments. And I go through all these sections as well, define the shared responsibility model, several questions, practice questions I've built for you, define cloud security and compliance concepts like PCI compliance and other compliances, as well as security aspects, identify access management policy with IAM, identify, identify resources for security support, like uh, you get a lot of tools that uh, AWS provides natively, as well as there are third-party supports. Um, Trusted Advisor, for example, is a base uh, built-in tool that you can use. So there are multiple options, and I cover all that. In domain three, that's technology-focused domain. I go in probably more depth than necessary here, but I thought I'll cover a little more than you need. So you, you're better prepared not only for this exam, but to start your journey for Solution Architect Associate or Developer Associate level certification. So I cover definitely cover those uh, to these topics, define methods of deploying, define the AWS global infrastructure like regions and availability zones and edge locations, identify the core services such as EC2, S3, identify resources for technology support, what do you turn to, I give you uh, 30, 40, uh, resources that you can use to uh, for your job as well as for your exam preparation. And then let's look at uh, domain number four, billing and pricing. 
That's a very important aspect of uh, this exam, how the billing works, what are the components in the, in the billing section, in the billing dashboard, and so on and so forth. So let's look at subtopics, compare and contrast the various pricing models, so like on-demand pricing, reserved instance pricing, spot instance pricing, so on and so forth. Recognize the various, various account structures, such as organizations, consolidated billing, and so on and so forth. And the third one is identify resources available for billing, the billing dashboard, the budgets, the cost explorer. I go over all of this in substantial detail as well as I have practice questions to test your knowledge. And then let's look at these two links. So I have these two links for you, uh, exam guide document. You click on that, it'll take you up to the AWS website and it has Similar information I already went through, the four domains, the details, a little more information, so make sure you go through that, understand the details of this section. And then the other link takes you straight to the uh, certification website for AWS CCP. So right there, you can see all the information and a few links. Exam cost is $100, it's a 90 minute exam. Um, to complete and it is uh, 65 questions I believe it doesn't say it here but look at my practice exam question those are the timed exam timed conditions so you should you should uh, follow that and that should do it for this uh, once again this is uh, AWS certified cloud practitioner uh, the blueprint, I call it rubric as well in, in my notes, so it's the same thing. Uh, exam guideline, whatever you call it, you know, there are multiple names for it, but it, this is sort of the basis for the entire course. Also the basis for the actual exam, how AWS is going to test you uh, based on this percentage that I talked about and all the subdomains, subtopics that I talked about, covered all over the place in the uh, in my course, so make sure that uh, you map it out. Uh, actually, all my sections are mapped to these domains, so you should be able to see that uh, the lectures are mapped to each one of these domains, and there are, in the end, practice exams, so on and so forth. Now, one thing I want to mention is the hands-on labs. You really don't actually need to go through any hands-on labs to pass this exam, but it's my philosophy that uh, it will make you a better engineer, it will make you a better professional, it will help you learn the material much quicker if you see how the hands-on works, and more importantly, if you try to do it yourself, whether you succeed or not, hopefully you will, mostly you will, but even if you don't, the process is going to teach you a lot more than just knowing the subject matter, even though it may take a little longer, but uh, you, you will be well on your way to even grab other certifications down the road. So make sure that you follow my process. You know, I have multiple lectures on how best to achieve your certifications, including this one and many others. So I think uh, if you follow the process, you'll be well on your way to pass this exam as well as be ready and a good certified cloud professional. Make lots and lots of money and share a lots and lots of money with, with me and uh, with your family as well, of course. I'm just kidding. But anyway, just you'll be happier and more successful if you follow the rubric, if you follow my guidelines. Thank you very much. Hello, Casey Shah here. In this segment, I'll talk about communication channels available to you. It is extremely important that you communicate with me and other fellow learners. The learners who collaborate are more likely to learn quickly and more efficiently. So you want to be one of those collaborators, one of those learners who communicates, right? So become active learner, right? Remember, there's a benefit to be an active learner in my course. The benefit is all active learners get one hour of free guidance from me if you are active learner. So collaborate. How do you collaborate? I put together a document for you. You can download it in this lecture as well as it's in the resources section of this course. So please go through that document. There are about 
dozen different communication channels that you have it open or available to you. The easiest one on Udemy to use would be the Q&A forum here inside the course. Within every lecture, you will see Q&A link. You can click on that to ask questions. So what I recommend is not only you should ask questions, but also you should answer other students' questions. Now, there's no wrong answer. This is all collaboration. This is, we all are in it together. Remember that we are working towards the same goal. All learners are in similar boat. Keep that in mind. So don't be shy asking questions. Don't think that anyone is going to bombard you. I'll be moderating the conversation. I'll be answering. I'll be also posting some questions uh, to increase the collaboration. Make sure you participate in those collaboration efforts, right? So the best thing to do is add a question or answer a question on Udemy Q&A section. What are the other options available to you? Uh, not preferred, but you can send me a private message. I don't recommend that for technical support because others may have the same question that you do. And it's hard for me to post that one as an instructor in the Q&A forum. So all the technical questions ask in the Q&A inside the course. But if you have other questions, suggestions, by all means, send me a private message. Uh, other options are go to my website. I have listed it in communication channel. There is a YouTube channel that I post a lot of videos there as well. Uh, then I have a Facebook page, Twitter handle, uh, Slack channel, number of other options that you have. Discussion forum. Uh, one thing I would recommend all of you to sign up for discussion forum. It's free. You can uh, not only get uh, good insight into what others are going through but also you're gonna find a lot of good information there sometimes I post information on the discussion forum that might be useful to you now keep in mind that it's gonna be that one question or one concept that you knew or that you came to know from one of these discussion or one of these collaboration effort that it's going to make a difference that is very likely to make a difference between past and not past. Now, I have taken, I've said it before, I've taken over 100 certification exams. I can tell you that many, many times it has come down to that one piece of information that I saw somewhere and either it helped me answer the question correctly or more often than not, it helped me eliminate you know, I was down to two choices and helped me eliminate one of those because I knew that information, right? So it's going to be one of those things that is going to help you. It cannot hurt you. It will only help you. It will increase your chances of passing, collaborate, communicate with me, other fellow learners. You have about a dozen channels. The most important one on Udemy is to, again, ask a question, answer a question, comment, Anything you can do to engage in learning, engage in collaboration, it's likely to help you. So get on board. I look forward to see your question and answer your questions as well as see your answers to others' questions as well. So let's succeed together. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello, Casey Shah from Hello Cloud Sets. In this segment, I want to go over exam taking tips. Now, over the years, I've taken over 100 IT certification exams and passed more than 40 certifications. And I have tried many things, you know, through success and failure, I have learned a lot in this process. And I'm going to share my experience with you in form of these exam taking tips. So let's jump in. I'm sharing this document with you. So I'm going to walk through that and then talk about my approach, my exam, exam taking tips approach. All right. So as I said, over the years, I've taken many certification exams and I have learned a lot, not just by success. Remember, by success and failure as well. And this I have summarized below. Right. So this is based on pro and I've tried many other things that may not have worked. So it's not here. So these are only things that has worked for me. And I've shared these tips with thousands of my learners and they seem to like it as well. So let's take a look at these tips and see if you like any of those. All right, here you go. Casey's tips. Take the exam while you're hot. This is number one tip. Why is it at number one? I don't have a number here, but this is my number one tip. What does it mean? For example, right, if you are taking, let's say, 
uh, uh, cloud architect associate in, in any either Google or AWS or Azure you're taking the cloud architect certification exam you want to go into that exam hot meaning you're studying heavily you're putting quality time going into the exam you study eight hours ten hours a day for a few days at least a few days maybe a week maybe two weeks in that case depending upon your level of knowledge uh, going into the exam uh, your field if you're changing the field or not it varies right some people may need but at least have a few days of solid study time dedicated to the certification exam preparation go through all the material that you have been going through go outline that you have developed over time uh, make sure that you're going in hot right that's what i mean going in cold would be you know last a couple of days your work was busy or if you had family commitment and you couldn't study before that you studied but that's not going in hot that's what i mean you know going into the exam it should look like you're just continuing your practice you're just stepping into um, into the exam center but you are on a roll already right so it should be a continuation of what you're doing as in preparing on a high gear at the end and not really get cold or even warm going into the exam so very important so going in hard what has happened in my experience many many times is not only i get the questions more questions right but the questions that i'm not sure i go get those right as well because my guesses are better you know my guesses improve because i am hot going into the exam i have you know a lot of this material is is circling around my head right so that's what i mean going into the exam hot you're going to answer the questions correct you know the note that you're going to know more questions you're going to know answers to more questions. Not only that, but like I said, you will also correctly guess the questions, answers going in hot. Very important. All right. The second tip here is during the exam, step away after every 15 questions. Very important to step away. Why? Because right about that point in time, about 15 questions, in my opinion, you are going to start uh, getting some fatigue you're thinking differently you may not feel that you may feel oh you're just fine and i have experimented with this extensively but you break away from it you know 30 seconds to 45 seconds definitely not over a minute because that'll be waste of your time and you're gonna lose time right the exam is not gonna stop for you so you are on your own clock but 30 seconds of complete quiet time, not think about this, these exam questions, think about something else, 45 seconds at the most, and then come back to this exam, right? So that is very important, like a clockwise, 15 questions, get up, 15 questions, get up, all right? Start reading the question, the call of the question. This one I have experimented extensively as well. You know, you have facts for a question, then say, what would be blah right best method uh, best practice least um, uh, expensive most cost effective method of doing this something like that then you have a b c and d options for example start reading at the call of the question and then scan the choices don't read them if you read word for word that's too much because you're going to read it momentarily again so just scan the call uh, answer choices read the call of the question so you know what you're ready for what is the question choices um, what are the question choices all about and what you should be looking for when you read the question now the fact pattern now you kind of ready for it it works you know almost all the time it eventually if you practice with it you will get better at it initially it may feel like it's not working but it has worked very well for me sometimes you know there's only one line question and in that case you're just not gonna have an option to do this but if it's two or three lines ideally three or more in two lines also you can straight away read questions but in three lines or more I would always go this route uh, even in two lines i go this route even in one line i go this route but uh, you know ideally it would work better for three lines or more three lines or longer question fact pattern with the question and choices but try with any any question it, it i use this exclusively in all my uh, certification exams all right so then like i said so that's what i'm describing here and then once you re finish that scanning go back read the question 
it's sequentially now you're gonna go like normally you know it's not waste of your time trust me if you develop this practice you're gonna be done with this question quicker on the long run than you may feel like you're reading it twice yes you're reading all of the question twice and once you just scan the choices but that's okay uh, you now have better grasp than you would just start because otherwise a lot of people reread the whole question and then call up the question so that's uh, you know even more waste of time or more use of your precious time so uh, then read the fact pattern and then try to eliminate right so these two are definitely wrong in your head uh, and then um, you know get to the last two choices that you think are close enough and go through the elimination process now if you are not 100% sure let me sc scroll this down um, so you narrow this down and pick the best answer right so now if you are not 100% sure so you have this question here and then call up the question a b c d if you're not let's say you eliminated these two you're not 100 percent sure between the two right less than 100 percent even one percent less you mark it mark the question all the software uh, all soft uh, testing vendors have that option so mark the option mark the question and then uh, you will be able to get back to it less than anything less than 100%. You may have, let's say, 75%, right? Three out of four questions marked that way. That's okay. Don't worry about it. And then in the second pass, what you're going to do is go to only the marked questions because less than 100%. Now you kind of see what you are 50% or more sure and mark those because time is probably running out for you. So now you have to make some discount, 50% uh, uh, or more content confident unmark those uh, questions right uh, unmark those and then third pass you know now you have let's say you started with uh, 50 questions in the first pass you mark 35 in the, the first pass in the second pass now you mark let's say 15 questions um, and then in the third pass so in the second pass uh, this this would from here to there you reduce it down to 50 percent uh, no, this was 100%, right? So first to the second step is if you're less than 100% sure, then you mark. Here you're less than 50% sure, then those are the 15 questions. You go again one more time. Now this time, the fourth pass, what you're going to do, no percentage, but you're going to see that whether you ran out of your knowledge limit. If there's something that you have no clue, something that you don't think that you'll be able to recall, you haven't seen before, you know, you just unmark them, you know, uh, pick an answer that you have picked or, you know, make another guess at this point and unmark them. So reduce 15 down to, let's say, five questions in the fourth pass. And then, you know, go through it one more time if you have to and uh, eliminate all of them. Get, your goal is to get this down to zero. And, you know, sometimes I don't get it down to zero. I just leave it at five because those still I'm not, I'm not sure, but I have reached my limit. Then you move on to this uh, one last thing. If you have time, obviously, this you have to manage the time and it comes with practice. That's why you have to practice with a lot of practice questions, uh, exam quality practice questions, similar degree of difficulty, similar length, you know, not just uh, uh, easy questions or something, you know, off the internet. Uh, anyways, so if none of the question is marked at this point right or say you, you still mark but you have no clue anymore so you don't want to worry about those uh, maybe unmark it or leave it marked that's fine now at this point i would ask you to just jump randomly right so what you do is randomly go to different questions uh, 23 39 11 15 19 uh, instead of going sequentially one two three because you know sometimes what happens is your mind is more active uh, in the beginning so you, you start going sequentially and you reach 10 and those 10 you probably answered when you were very fresh right so go randomly in this random order pick some from the beginning some from the middle some from the end and then answer those questions uh, or double check your answers for those questions uh, change but you know eventually you have to use your gut and you have to use your uh, intuition at that point if for the questions that you're not 100 percent sure and you know if you practice with this method i guarantee you you will improve dramatically uh, it has worked very well for me and this 
is again one of those things that I've been sharing throughout this and many of my courses. My experience and expertise over more than two decades of taking so many exams, passing those, achieving certifications, writing training programs, helping tens of thousands of learners. This is sort of culmination of my exam tips for IT certification courses. I have another one for the law students as well, which is slightly different, but this one works very well for the IT technology uh, certification. So make sure to try this again in your practice, uh, especially in all my practice exam related courses, questions that I have, you know, I have 180 to 300 questions for each one of the cloud certifications. At the time of your viewing, I may not have for all the exams out there, but I have a game plan. I'm working towards it. I have many already done and I'm publishing on a regular basis. And also there are many other resources you should tap onto for a given certification exam. Make sure to do many practice exam questions and go through this approach, the tips that I have been sharing with you, if it makes sense to you. Uh, you cannot just enter the exam and try all these tips for the first time. You have to practice with it to make sure that you're comfortable with it and you understand. I mean, yeah, some of them you can perhaps like get up every 15 questions. You can definitely try straight away first time. But uh, in some of my courses, in some of my uh, offerings, I have like a full sim full scale simulation exam exact number of questions similar rubric uh, for example if you know they have uh, cloud com uh, compute engine for what percentage so i follow those and then similar type of uh, timing that i choose in exact same timing that you're allowed to complete that test so you can practice with those and that's going to help you to master this and really pass this uh, certification exam on your next attempt so give it a shot and do let me know if your feedback you know positive negative uh, if uh, there are any other tips that has worked for you um, then let me know I can certainly share with my learning community as well so that should do it for this case's exam taking tips for IT certifications make sure to practice with it before you take the actual certification exam then if you have any question feel free to reach out to me through communication channels thank you very much I look forward to see you bye bye Hello, Casey Shah once again. We are almost to the end of this course. At this point, I would like to reevaluate the outcome. If you remember in the beginning of this course, we went through the outcomes that I'm targeting for this course, and we made sure that your expectations are also aligned with the targeted outcomes. At this point, I would like both of us to self-evaluate. I just opened the document again, targeted outcomes, and I went through each and every item in that, and I feel that I've held my end of the bargain. I went through all that I wanted to go through. I gave you enough information. I gave you a lot of material, videos, PDF documents, commentary, expert advice, so on and so forth. I want you to now do a self-evaluation, open the PDF attached to this lecture, also in resources section, uh, about the targeted outcomes. Go through each and every outcome. Let's ensure that we have achieved the outcomes together. Remember, you also had a big part to play here. I had given you assignments, I had given you quizzes, I had given you outline template, you were supposed to update the outline, so on and so forth. I want to make sure that we work together and we succeed together. Thank you very much. I'll leave the light on for you. Casey Shah, bye-bye. Well, 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 believe me or not, you made it through this course. Congratulations. I am super proud of your grit and commitment throughout this course. Job well done. One thing I would recommend is to keep checking this course for latest updates. Even if you have finished this course 100%, you reached the conclusion and beyond and you're finished, but you haven't taken or passed your certification exam, make sure to check this. How would you know? Well, keep an eye on educational announcements. I do send out regular educational announcements in this course. You will receive it via email. You will also receive it as a notification in Udemy portal. And you will know that if I added material via that. Now, remember, this course is like cloud computing. It is elastic. My course content keeps growing. 
Why? Because I want to give a lot more to my learners. Oftentimes, a vendor also make changes to their curriculum, to the blueprint, the rubric. I quickly make updates to my documentation, to my courses as well. And as a result, you're going to see more content for your course. So it is elastic. It's going to keep growing over time. Uh, so you should keep checking once again before you pass your certification exam. Another aspect is there is a section called contents based on your feedback. So my learners give me very valuable feedback via private messages here on Udemy and other communication channels. And I do take those seriously. I do incorporate those. As a result, I add the content, which sometimes otherwise doesn't fit into the flow I have for the rest of the courses. Then I would add it to the contents based on learners feedback or your feedback so uh, let me know if your feedback if you have any obviously it has to be reasonable it has to be something relevant and all that and if i find that i can fairly quickly add that to this content based on your feedback another section at the end of this course is uh, called casey's mind music section uh, what is it i can assure you that there are no songs in there it is a mind music playing in my head. I'm constantly thinking about the course material, thinking about my learners, taking their feedback in. And I have so much more material for additional courses or even this course. But having an idea in my head and converting that into consumable lecture or material by you in this course, it does take some time. So what I have come up with is in this section, I'm going to post somewhat raw material, right? I, I might just record on my iPhone and then just post it here, something that I'm working on. But it's important for you if you're taking an exam in the near future or some idea that came to me that never made it to this course. So that's the point of uh, keep checking the course content for this course again well after you finish uh, the course you will reach the conclusion stage but before you have taken and passed your certification exam keep checking it maybe put in a reminder if you want or at least look out for my educational announcements and emails and the uh, udemy messages here that would give you an idea of what is this elastic content, what content got added to what section. Uh, you know, I have multiple sections, as I mentioned to you. I have resources. I may add resources there. I have uh, course content, obviously. I may add section or lectures into that. Then I have contents based on your feedback section that I talked about. I have cases, my music for raw material that I talked about. And of course, Q&A and other forums would help you as well if you keep checking the course content. It is my request to you that keep me posted, keep me posted all along this course. So when you're making progress or even when you're not making progress, maybe keep me posted so I can help you. I can jump on a WebEx Zoom meeting and we can be on the phone and I can get you moving forward. Remember, I offer one free hour of training, one free hour of guidance to all my active learners. You can take advantage of that as well. Keep me posted when you schedule your exam because I can also hop on a web conference with you to make sure that you are well prepared going into the exam. Now, there's no guarantee if I say you're prepared and you don't pass it or vice versa, it could happen, has happened, happens, you know, uh, now and then. But But generally speaking, I can gauge whether you are able to or you're ready you're prepared and you're likely to pass or not right so give me that opportunity if you can again it's free of cost to you no charge and after you take the test whether you pass or don't pass do let me know because i care once again if you don't make it we need to have a game plan going forward if you do make it if you pass the exam then let's celebrate you know we can uh, certainly uh, have an online uh, celebration, so to speak. I do have a Hall of Fame, Hello Hall of Fame on my website, and I'd be happy to add your name. And if you want to provide any blur with the return or audio or video, everything is optional. Even to get on Hello Hall of Fame is optional. But I care about your success. I care about being part of your journey. I want to be part of your journey with your help. So, uh, you know, I'm in touch with a lot of my learners even decade later. I've taught, like I said, tens of thousands of learners over my career. 
and many dozens of those I'm still in touch uh, well after a decade of uh, being a student. A lot of them have become my uh, partners, employees, uh, co-instructors, teaching assistants. So if you once you pass the exam and if you have some passion to join me as a TA or as a as an in co-instructor for other courses, do let me know. I would love to collaborate. I would love to explore that opportunity with you if you are passionate about it. I'm looking for passionate and driven people. And uh, if you are one of those, do let me know. Once again, thank you very much for signing up for this course. It is my tremendous honor to have you on board in this course. Thank you very much. Signing out.